You can put your hand down. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Calling to order the board meeting of uh, Greater Richmond Transit Company um, for August of 2021. Um, and I note that all of the board members are present. Uh, George, yeah, I can see your face, good. So um, let's, and many of the staff, thank you for being here and the CEO. And let's begin with uh, public comments and notice of the, what the Zoom meeting is all about. Ms. Rose morning, Pace, Mr. Chair. morning. Good morning. Mm -hmm. This meeting is being conducted virtually in compliance with City of Richmond Ordinance Number 2020-093. The public notice, meeting agenda, and agenda attachments for this August 17th, 2021 standing meeting of the boards of GRTC, Ride Finders, and Old Dominion Transit Management Company were posted on August 12th, 2021 at ridegrtc.com. For the meeting notice, all written comments received via email by Carrie Rose Pace prior to 5 p.m. on the day preceding a meeting were provided to all members of the board the night before the meeting and are read during the public comment period of the meeting by staff following the two-minute speaking limit and will be included in the minutes of the meeting. Also, per the meeting notice, this meeting is being live streamed on YouTube. This meeting, I received no submitted comments in writing. This concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, now we need a motion to approve the minutes of the last meeting. So moved. Second, please. Second. All in favor of approving the minutes of last meeting, say aye. 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 All opposed, the minutes are approved. Um, our next um, item is um, a development engagement report from Adrian Torres, our director of planning and a whole lot of other things. Yes, Julie. If I might, um, for the, the viewers who are uh, not um, with us in person, which clearly that's everyone, uh, I just wanted to uh, make a request to the board that we do modify the agenda that was submitted to the public and to the board to move the item, the action item that is currently the, under the financial and administrative report, action item A, the resolution for support of multi-year zero fare grant application to shift that to be earlier in the gen agenda to be the new item C under um, section four uh, to go after both uh, the GRTC bus shelter program and the RVA rapid transit better bus program and have put that earlier on the agenda to allow for adequate time for all members of the board to have participate in the item and discussion. All right, is there any objection to that? Uh, Thank you. So moved. All righty. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. It happens. Uh, so item C under four will be our, our work on the uh, discussion and of a multi-year zero fare grant application. Um, and um, let's proceed then with uh, Ms. Torres report. Good morning. I'm just going to introduce um, Raquel Aguirre. She is our bus stop um, and amenities improvement program manager, and she is going to give us an update on the five year bus shelter um, program. Thank you. Good morning. Um, as Adrian said, my name is Raquel Aguirre. Um, Good I'm morning. Going to I'm going to talk to you today about uh, our updated goals. Give me just a moment to share my screen. All right, um, and can someone please confirm that you're now looking at my presentation? Thank you. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit quickly. I've got a lot of information to get through. Um, let's start off with a little refresher. These are of course photos of the new style of shelter that we adopted a couple of years ago. These are all variations on the Brasco Eclipse style shelter. City of Richmond chose the slanted roof. Um, in traffic, Black and Henrico and Chesterfield counties chose the arched roof uh, in either green or black. Um, what we really liked about this style of shelter is that we can order the walls with different configurations. So whenever possible, obviously we like to have three full walls um, that just offers the most coverage from the elements. Um, but when we're dealing with limited space or limited right of way, we do have the option of, off of um, ordering partial walls or even no walls, and that just allows us to install in a greater range of locations. 
So let's move on to our updated goals. Um, GRTC currently has 1,650 active stops and just under 49% of them are ADA compliant right now. We would like to bring everything possible of the remainder up into ADA compliance. Please, what does ADA compliance require? Um, so the core requirement is a five by eight landing pad, um, but I've got some photos. So I'll walk you through what exactly we're trying to do and how we wanna get there in a moment. Um, our second goal is that we want to increase the total number of stops that have essential transit infrastructure. So essential transit infrastructure is what we used to refer to as amenities, that is specifically shelters, benches, and trash cans. So we want to bring that total number of stops with infrastructure up to 50% over all of our total stops. So let me dive into those numbers a little bit more. Um, right now we have 85 stops that have shelters, that's 5% of our overall total we would like to increase that number to 246 by the end of fiscal year 27. So that would be 15% of our stops that would have shelters. Uh, right now we have 204 stops that have benches, which is just 12% of our overall total. We want to increase that number to 576. That would bring our number of stops with benches to 35 for a combined total of 50% of our stops that have some sort of infrastructure. So to reach these number goals, we're going to have to install pretty aggressively. We're looking at 26 shelters per year, 47 benches per year, and just over 71 trash cans per year. Um, so let's talk about the associated costs. Um, so purchase and installation of these sort of hard goods is listed in these three columns here. And this is probably akin to what you were presented last year for our shelter plan. These are the normal costs associated with the five-year installation of those things. You can see that we have this additional uh, column this year for ADA improvements, and, and that's a pretty large number. It's just over $3 million per year that we would expect to need to reach our ADA goals. Um, so we understand that this is a big jump up. Um, I will show you that the projects that we've undertaken so far, we've done so with additional grant funding, and that's stuff that we applied for internally and also in collaboration with our regional partners. Um, and we're really expecting to have to do a little bit of legwork and hunt down some additional grants to sort of fill that gap. Um, this is really just our aspirational column. We've got an ambitious goal overall and ADA compliance would really just be uh, the big overarching goal at the end. So this is back to your question. Let me talk a little bit more about um, ADA compliance, what it means and how we wanna get there. So the photo on the right is a stop that we are pleased with. You can see that there is this five by eight rectangle of, of clear space next to our bus stop sign. This is what we refer to as a landing pad. And this is just a clear stable area that allows passengers a place to wait for the bus um, and to step onto after getting off of the bus. Now this is really a picture of an ideal setup because you can see that our landing pad is connected to the sidewalk behind it. So not only is our bus stop um, secure and ADA compliant, but um, there's a clear traversable path behind. So pedestrians just in general can get to and from the stop safely. Let's compare this to the photo on the left. Um, this is really not a great bus stop. You can see that this person is standing on a steep grade, um, is uncomfortably close to the street, um, isn't standing on concrete, is standing on dirt, which will obviously turn to mud in the weather. So these are the types of stops that we really want to target. Um, they just leave a lot to be desired in terms of safety, um, comfort, and accessibility. So we're going to go about this in a couple of different ways. Um, these are some photos of our landing pad pilot project that just wrapped up last month. Um, this was um, 29 stops that we chose on the south side, and we contracted out to have these landing pads installed. Um, the cost, this was administered internally, um, and the cost for stop for this type of project comes to about $5,000 per stop. So additionally, um, we would like to undertake or collaborate on these types of larger, more ambitious projects. This is a page from a plan of the City of Richmond's, City of Richmond's Transit Access Project. Uh, the City of Richmond applied for a CMAT grant on our behalf. Uh, the final scope of the project is going to improve 88 bus stops. You can see the two bus stops in this um, area up here on to the north of the drawing. Um, what I, 
I really like about this, though, is that City of Richmond has the ability to address things that are outside of the scope of GRTC specifically. So in addition to these improved bus stops, which are also getting the landing, pa landing pads uh, comparable to the ones pictured in the slide before, they're also getting just street improvements. We've got crosswalks going in, curb cuts, uh, paint markings. This is obviously a bigger project, more ambitious. Um, Plan RVA estimated that these types of sidewalk and pedestrian improvement projects can cost about um, upwards of $1 million per mile. Um, this project was not quite uh, that high. I think the budget for these 88 stops came in at $958,000. However, you can see how that would be a big driver for that budget table that I showed earlier. Um, again, these are big plans, big projects, big associated costs, but we think that they're worth um, worth it just in the overall improved conditions. Um, let me pivot a little bit. Let me talk to you about how we choose which stops um, are going to get these hard goods, the shelters and benches. So let's talk about just this top row. First of all, this is our eligibility rubric and this is our current status, this top row. Um, this is a points-based rubric so it's based heavily on um, ridership. So we look at the average daily boardings as a way of prioritizing which stops are going to get these shelters and benches. Um, the thing is, it's not strictly ridership. We also always want to consider stops that maybe aren't as high ridership, but have sort of mitigating circumstances, stops that are adjacent to employment centers, social service agencies, senior housing schools, maybe stops that are used as transfer points, or maybe stops where there's not a route that passes by frequently. So if you're waiting for 15 minutes or more, we wanna give you more consideration to have um, a place to sit. Um, what you will see when I walk you through some of the maps later in the presentation is that if we are able to meet our very aggressive um, installation goals, we're going to kind of make our way through all of our eligible stops about halfway through our five-year plan. So I think that's a good problem to have. When that happens, we're gonna lower our threshold. We'll move under these tier two stops um, that are still used obviously, but uh, they're not as high ridership. And we'll go on and populate those stops with infrastructure. What I really want you to take away from this slide is um, this is not non-negotiable. This is not the end all be all. This is just a framework that we use to prioritize sorting through all of our 1600 stops. All of our stops and all of our infrastructure requests we consider on a case by case basis um, and we want to be good partners, we want to be good stewards, we want to provide good service. Um, so this is just sort of a guidance um, and, and please don't take it as the end all deal. Let's talk about our bench installation problem, uh, program specifically. Um, this is really how our rubric that I just showed you um, looks on a map. So Everything that has a black dot on our transit service area map is where we have a bench currently installed. Everything with the purple dot is a stop that is eligible under our current rubric. And everything that has a blue dot is something that would come into eligibility once we lower those thresholds in a couple of years. The other thing that I wanna briefly mention about our bench program is that we would really like to introduce some additional styles of benches um, and bench amenities. So these semi seats pictured on the left have been popping up at transit agencies lately and we think they'd be a really good fit for GRTC in a couple of specific situations. Um, firstly, we think that they're really good when we have limited row um, that happens quite a bit within the city. Um, so if we can't fit a full size bench, but we can not offer seating in the form of something like this, we would love to do that. Um, also, these are approximately half the size of a full size bench, so these might be a good fit for some of our um, lower ridership stops where we'd still like to offer seating, um, but maybe we can distribute those among more stops this way. This photo on the right is really more of a conceptual drawing. There's something I came, we came across in our research that uh, we thought was a good idea. Um, we would love to find something modular um, either off the shelf or that we fabricate. Um, that could just snap on to our existing benches. We would love to add some additional shelter from the elements if possible. So as I said, these are both in the pilot phase, um, but we look forward to getting these um, in some form out on the road in the near future. 
Okay, so let's talk about our shelter installation plan. This is sort of a snapshot of our current baseline. We've got 85 stops that have shelters within the system right now. Um, and we're simultaneously working on two separate things for our shelter plan. The first is we have 30 installations in progress. Those are shelters that are either in-house now or um, on their way, and we want to have those completely installed by the end of this fiscal year. We are also simultaneously working on our site selection for next fiscal year. Um, so the way our process works is that we start with this larger batch of eligible stops, um, and we're spending we spend two to three months doing site visits. Um, that's where we go out in person to the stops and just take detailed measurements and photos and decide what style shelter is appropriate for the site, coordinate with the jurisdictions, decide if we need any MOUs or easements um, to have a better installation. Um, at the end of the two or three month period, we're gonna narrow this batch down to 26 stops. And I think it's important to note that if um, a stop doesn't make the cut this year, but it's still eligible, it doesn't just go away. It just gets pushed to consideration for a further year. Um, and this is really an iterative process. So what's gonna happen is that we will move on and repeat this process next year. And for the next four years of our uh, five-year program, we will just continue to move through those tiers that I mentioned before. Um, we will have these purple dots are our tier one and these green dots are our tier two. So next steps, um, we are obviously moving forward with our shelter and um, infrastructure installations. Um, the other big thing is that we wanna to continue to coordinate with our regional partners and track down that funding. Um, these are really ambitious goals, as I said, that we're excited to get moving on and we're ready to get started. Um, that is the end of my presentation. What questions can I answer for you? Uh, Mr. Campbell, I believe that you are muted. Would you go back to your initial cost piece um, at the beginning? The five-year plan, yeah, that's it. Um, so that ADA estimate, what what is involved in that particular? Um, is that the pads? Is that the full treatment of intersections? What is that? That's a combination of both. So it's not necessary to do all of that in order to do this properly. The, um, the pad is the only necessary thing, correct? Sure, we could do just pads um, at any of our stops. I think that if you're looking at a stop like this, there's really no way to do just a pad there though. Um, a stop that was this sort of drastic <coughs> would really need some major infrastructure improvements. And so that's the kind of thing that's figured in that 3 million? Yes. All right. So. Um, I, what was not clear in this lengthy newspaper article, and I think needs to be clear here, is that GRTC has no money of its own to pay for this. Uh, we are we are a really intentional transportation company for Metro Richmond, but uh, we have to get grant money basically uh, to pay for this work. Is that correct? That's correct. If I may jump in here, um, Raquel. Please. Mr. Campbell, may I answer this question? Of course. Uh, that is, is uh, there is a, quite a bit of the funding that we would need that I believe does need to come from grants, either from um, regional allocations by the TPO, uh, application of our local partners such as Richmond, Chesterfield, or Enrico regarding their own sidewalk infrastructure program, possible discretionary grants at the state and the federal level, the ADA level of accessibility to some of our stops is really beyond our ability to totally do on our own. However, the cost of the shelters and the benches, um, we do have as we move forward into our capital plan for the next several years, we will be able to prioritize some funding from our 5307 and 5339 to be able to do some of these shelters as we have in the past. We'll also be looking for partnerships, philanthropic businesses to partner with us but you are correct that we cannot do all of this alone. This is well, the, the money that you yes. save with those numbers, that's federal grant money that uh, then becomes allocated for this, correct? 5307. 5307 and 5339 are our federal formula funds that come right. to us every year. That we and then we can by money. discretion direct to this purpose. Yeah, I, yes, it's sir. really a great program, but I just I want to make it clear that, you know, we'd love to do 
as we want to do a lot and we'd love to do more, um, but it's not like it's paid for um, by any pot of money that uh, somehow we have sitting around. Other that questions or comments, please. I love this program. Yes, I have, I have a question uh, on the design of the uh, benches. Is that the design of the benches that I see here? Uh, I'm sorry, do you said of the benches? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, let me get back to her. I'm sorry, let me find the slide. So these are, oops. So these are the current benches. Um, the Victor Stanley, these are all weather steel. Um, these are the ones that have been approved by the city of Richmond by the planning commission in UDC. Um, so we use them transit system wide to maintain uniformity. Okay. Um, the new seats, um, we're still need to focus in on a design. Um, these are just a couple of the options available from different vendors, but we haven't really gotten to the selection stage yet. Uh, my my question is, is there a uh, divider in the seats where I won't be able to lay down on the bench? Ah, mm. so there is an optional divider. We are actually just ordered some of these to begin installing. It's just sort of recently come to the forefront that RPD requested we install some of those. So that's an optional add-on that we're looking to, to sort of retrofit. Okay. The other question too, you said each stop will have its own trash can. So our goal is that every stop that has a shelter and a bench will also have a trash can. Um, uh, who maintain trash or collection? So it varies by jurisdiction. Um, City of Richmond um, is maintained by DPW. Um, and we have to get prior approval from them and make sure that it's on their trash outs before we install anything. Um, Henrico County actually installs and maintains their own trash cans. And Chesterfield County, we install trash cans that they maintain. Okay, all right, thank you. Yes, sir. Further questions, comments? Thank you very much for this report. And I think we have a guest, right, Adrian? Yes, mm -hmm. um, we have Faith um, from RBA Rapid Transit will be doing a presentation on their new Better Bus Stop program. So I'm actually going to go ahead and share. Her Wonderful. Welcome, Faith Walker. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. All right, just tell me what do you want me to take ahead? All right, so I'll go ahead and start. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Faith Walker, and I am the Director of Community Engagement with RVA Rapid Transit. Um, as some of you may know, RVA Rapid Transit is a nonprofit dedicating, dedicated to educating and advocating for frequent and far-reaching public transit um, within the Richmond region. Uh, we're grateful for the invitation to share about a program that we've recently launched called the Better Bus Stop Program. And we can go to the next slide. So um, the program is broken down into two parts. Uh, one focuses on being a sponsor, increasing the number of shelters in our public um, transit system by sponsoring or donating funds. Um, the second part is focused on adopting a stop, litter, uh, litter cleanup at bus stops. And in addition to those two parts, um, the clean bus stops pilot, uh, we will be tending to 14 bus stops within the East End uh, where Bonds, of course, just donated shelters to. So uh, next slide. So I'll dive into um, what those parts represent and mean. Um, as we just talked about, the number one way to increase the number of shelters and benches in our region is more funding. So what we wanna do is we wanna encourage individuals, businesses, and organizations to sponsor the installations of um, benches and shelters. Uh, now, here's a comment from a writer, um, from the Writer's Voice program we have. This is Uzella. Uh, she takes the 1B in front of the senior apartment that she lives in. She says, as hot as it's getting now, we need to have some kind of shelter to keep us from out of the sun. So we're encouraging those sponsors to support the overall system as a whole 
but we will not turn down uh, any community uh, focus effort like bonds accords with the installations in the East End. Um, to the next slide. So um, the next is adopting a stop. Um, we're asking um, civic associations, organizations, individuals throughout the Richmond region to adopt the stop for at least one year. Um, they will be committed to regular cleaning, um, trash and litter pickup uh, monthly, but we encourage more um, if necessary or if they like. They also will commit to cleaning the glass. Um, as Raquel showed you, there's some shelters that have glass associated with them. Um, some do not. So in the event that um, we would ask them to clean that glass twice a year, but also inform RVA Rapid Transit when litter pickup or cleanup occurs by uh, filling out our adopter's diary. And so with this adopter's diary, the adopter is able to input information like how many pieces of trash picked up in a particular day. And then that way we can start to collect some data of current trends, um, but also issues that occur. Um, those adopters will also inform us of a, a illegal items or things that we can uh, report to the authorities. And then the also the Let's see. Also, we encourage them to report any vandalism, um, any safety issues. Uh, we just had a general report from the Willowlawn bus, three screws missing from a glass piece of the shelter. Um, and so thank you GRTC team for putting the ticket in so quickly, we appreciate that. But those are the um, information and things that we're collecting. Um, now our commitment would be that we're um, asking the adopters to, um, oh, excuse me, we're committing to providing those adopters with startup kits. And those startup kits will include a safety vest, a trash picker, a one-time supply of trash bags and rubber gloves. Um, we also promise to pass on any information that we receive from an adopter, um, safety concerns, like I just mentioned, suspicious packages, or even maybe some items maybe left by some writers, we wanna return that back to GRTC. Um, we will also commit to listing the adopters in, on our website, but also any press releases we have, but also a big thanks to GRTC providing the recognition plaques on the adopted stops. And next slide. So the progress we've made so far, we've um, the 15 stops to your left, Raquel um, provided us, um, these stops are listed as high as litter complaints. And so we're encouraging uh, the adopters who wanna adopt to adopt those 15 first. And so I wanna shout out to Greater Refuge Church. Um, they adopted the stop at Third and Dale. Um, Bill Betzhold, uh, he adopted a stop at Willow Lawn. And then Keep Virginia Cozy, they are an environmental group who have some cleanup efforts that currently take place in Carytown. And so they committed to not only uh, maintaining their commitment in Carytown, but adopting those stops surrounding Carytown. So that's 14 stops out of there. So thank you for that. Um, slide number six. And so um, now big thanks again to Bonds of Course team who awarded us a grant um, to launch this pilot. They are committed to maintaining the stops that they've already invested in um, by maintaining them for the next one year with this pilot. Now, we have been able to contract a local business um, by the name of Gleam LLC to systematically clean 14 stops within the East End. Um, these weekly cleanings and data collection will take place uh, this month. Um, through July of 22. Our hope is to use um, the data and um, that we collected for future grants, but also um, maintaining bus riders um, essentials. Now we are hiring. Um, Glean LLC is committed to those in need to be given opportunity that are through the dignity of work. So this pilot will allow us to create three new jobs within the East End. And my closing slide. 
Um, we at RVA Rapid Transit um, believe that, and I believe everyone here today also believes that bus stops should be dignified places for people to wait. Uh, with this program and the support from local individuals and businesses, we can make that happen. Uh, making essentials like shelters and benches and the maintenance of them priority will build a transit system where riders feel dignified and local business um, owners, homeowners no longer see bus stops as litter magnets, but as new clients and new neighbors, um, but which will all um, make overall the growth and expansion for our region possible. So thank you so much again for allowing me to share. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at faith at rvrapidtransit.org, or you can visit our website for more information. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Walker, for that excellent presentation and encouraging program. Are there any comments or questions at this point? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Torres. I think we're, uh, does that complete your, uh, your stuff for tonight, for today, Adrian? I believe this does, right? Yes, and passing back to Julie. All right, thank you very much. So now we're going to uh, the CEO, hi, Bonnie. We're going to the CEO, uh, Julie Tim, for uh, our item on uh, zero fares. Uh, you're gonna make a presentation, correct? Yes, sir. And it will take me just a moment to get this to just the right spot so that I got good at this for a while and let's see so I'm sharing this and now I'm going to put it into slideshow and are you seeing the multiple screen or the full screen you're seeing the presentation view Okay, so you're, I'm on the right one, Rob? No, you're seeing your view with the notes. That's not what I want. Stop your I sharing. Want, I want this. Oh, she can just press that. Yeah. There you Is go. Is that what I want? Yep. Awesome. Thank you very much. It's uh, the, the joys of being able to do virtual means that um, we always have a little bit of technical smoothness to work on. So Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to present today on the transit fare considerations. This is a topic that we have been discussing at GRTC for uh, since before I arrived almost two years ago. Uh, yes, it's been almost two years where the, the team here was looking at alternative fare collection systems to be able to uh, advance a more uh, a smoother, uh, more consistent, fair structure and fair collection methodology throughout the entire system. Um, as we moved into COVID, uh, much of that effort was halted so that we could pivot and make sure that the safety of our service was put forefront. And with the data that we've collected over the past year, now we have an opportunity to reconsider and bring back an analysis of different fair collection and fair system methodologies that would be best for this region. So if, I, if you can indulge me for a moment, I'd like to give a little bit of background. I know this presentation is longer than we normally have at a board meeting, but it, there's so much weight to it that it will just take me a little bit longer to get through than a normal presentation. So beginning with a discussion about our fare system, I believe it's really very relevant to understand who is riding our system, what they're riding, how they're riding, how they're paying. Um, and this slide provides a, 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 an interesting snapshot of what our ridership, how they're, they're interacting before, during, and now, uh, COVID. And also, pre-COVID, we did an origin destination survey that collected a lot of data just prior to COVID that let us know the basic demographic makeup of our ridership, as well as how they were accessing with fares, what fares they were using, and how they were paying. So the very first set of graphs it, on the left hand side shows that the blue, green, and uh, gray columns show that pre COVID, in July of 2019, pre COVID, we had a, a significant amount of our ridership was local. We had a, a very good express service. BRT 
even though it's a smaller amount of ridership compared to local, the very small size of it uh, compared to the number of miles we put on local means that we did have a pretty significant level of capacity and ridership on BRT. Um, when we went into COVID, the green line, you can see that compared year to year comparison in July, by about the time that COVID testing became, our ridership, which had dropped dramatically in um, the May and June, was really starting to recover as early as July 2020 on our local buses. And that's not the case for Express. Um, BRT continues to be about 50%. Um, but the, the, what was really interesting here to learn was something we inherently knew but really became very um, in our face was that the express service is not our dominant service type. Uh, it's, it's predominantly commuters who are coming into and out of downtown. And when COVID hit, they were able to transfer their employment to a telework environment. And so they no longer needed to use that express uh, to get to work. They were staying home, which we appreciate because we wanted to keep essential service only on our buses. But that means that you know, those, uh, that ridership was no longer part of our cal uh, calculations. As of last month, our local bus service is back to those pre-pandemic ridership levels. BRT is quickly approaching pre-pandemic, but express ridership is still significantly down. It's no longer at that 90% level, but it's around 75% level down. Now, why that's relevant is when you start looking at the incomes of uh, the BRT riders versus local riders versus express riders and how they're paying for their fares, um, that when you look at the express riders in particular, express riders overall, when you look at the far right set of bars, uh, that green column uh, under express, so that you see the green, there's a green bar, that's not all green. There's some other areas in there, but the, the most significant portion of express riders were not actually paying their fares directly from their own pocket. Um, they were either getting reimbursed or they had a pass that was paid for by their employer or the agency they worked for or the school system they worked for. Um, these were people who were able to get those employer passes, those 30-day passes that they didn't pay for. And so that, that is an expression of the business community supporting their ridership. When you look at the BRT, um, and you see the, the same green section, about 50% of people who are riding BRT also were getting that university pass or the e-pass at the VCU. So when you see the, the drop in ridership that happened under COVID, it, it, is pr it pretty much parallels the number of people that were riding using that green pass. And that makes complete sense because we know that VCU shut down and the state shut down well, they, they teleworked. I shouldn't say they shut down. The city, they teleworked. They, they didn't have need to use the system, use BRT, to access their jobs because they were teleworking. Compare that to the local bus service, what you see is a very high percentage of those riders uh, that were using the one-day passes and the cash ride passes, which are the, the orange and the gray portions of the column. Um, those riders are tend to be our lowest income riders, riders who have household income below 25,000 a year. Some of the riders that are in that 50,000 or less, which is in total about 78% of our ridership, 74% of our ridership, they're using the, the seven day passes, but they're not able to access or they don't have appear to have access to those discounted passes that are 30-day or university passes or employer passes. And those are the people that continue to ride throughout the pandemic. What we know is that looking at those geographically, as COVID continued to progress, our local bus route, and this shows our, shows our local bus routes, continue to have very, very high ridership, as I just showed. But when you look at where they were riding from and going to, it aligns very closely with a map of the economically distressed areas of our region. So that further confirms what we already knew about our ridership, that there was a significant amount of the essential workforce and uh, that were making a very low income compared to uh, people in, a, in white collar jobs that were able to telework, and they were coming from areas that were economically distressed. So 
this is something I think that many of us intuitively know, but having it proven through the, the, the COVID environment and looking at this data was very startling uh, and eye-opening to at least me personally to, to have this shown so dramatically. As we move forward, the context around fares becomes important because when we then look at where, how much fares are coming from different modes and different populations, what we see is that when we look at by mode in particular, which is the table on the left and the bottom portion of it, when we know that the majority of our local ridership are coming from our essential workers, coming from economically distressed areas who continue to work through COVID, and we're predominantly paying with cash and run ride, run ride fares, we also see that the predominant amount of our fare collection coming from them uh, is also shown here as $5.2 million of our total. The BRT amount of 1.6, we know that at least half of that, or a good portion of that as we showed in the prior slide, is coming from those university passes and the express uh, 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 revenues of about half a million, the predominant amount, that was also coming from business-related passes or university passes. So the the vast majority of the fair collections that we have uh, been collecting historically, as shown in our 2019 data, um, that were coming directly from riders, were coming off of the local service from riders who were essential workforce, who worked throughout COVID, and typically would pay pre-COVID with cash or one ride passes. Okay, so that's the foundation of now considering how we move forward with a fair collection analysis. Do we continue with fair collection the way we've historically done it? Do we look at how to proceed with studying zero fares and what that looks like socially and economically as well as business for GRTC? Or do we con uh, consider looking at what we were, we were originally going towards, which is still a valid model of this account-based fare system? So we did a, an analysis, and this is several slides to give some um, some high-level data around the costs and then the expenses and the revenues associated with these three different models of collecting fares. So in the far left column, when we look at the 2019 fare system, the fare system that we had pre-COVID, you look at the administrative costs of administering that system, it was around $300,000. Now there's some other costs in there as well, a couple hundred thousand dollars of costs for the, the the fair um, technology staff. I've removed those from the presentation, prior presentations I've shown them, because they're consistent and they would stay in all of these. Uh, even if we went zero fair, they do significantly more than the fair system. They do our clever system. They do all of the technology in the buses. So we call them our fair uh, technology staff, but truly they're just the bus technology staff. I don't mean just, I mean exceptional bus technology staff. So they're no longer on the slide. Uh, you'll also see that uh, when you go to the zero fare system, most of those costs, that's the system that we are currently in under the COVID environment, we removed uh, the expenses from our current budget. There, so you would expect to see no expenses. Some of our staffing money room, uh, money room staff, uh, there are several personnel. Some of them we were able to move over to other positions and fill voids and staffing in other parts of the agency. And that's where that 135,000 comes from, is our people that were in the money room staff who decided to stay with GRT throughout COVID, and we were able to reutilize uh, them throughout the agency and other locations. A couple of folks did decide to leave GRTC to find uh, employment elsewhere, uh, as they, they, the assignments here were um, not what they wanted, and they found better opportunities, and we appreciate that they stayed with us uh, for the length. When we look at the account-based system, our costs start to go up dramatically. Um, dramatically might be a strong word. The, the, our costs go up, I should say. What you'll see is a natural amount of inflation between 2019 to the account-based system. I assumed an implementation of the account-based system in FY23, and so I, I made a factor of what uh, the cost would be between 2019 and 2023. So that's a, the slight escalation in most, most of these for the RPS, Richmond Public Schools Pass Program. Under an account-based system, I assume that those costs would go up more significantly because if uh, the assumption under account-based, which may or may not hold true, is that 
the city of Richmond has expressed uh, support for being zero fare, at least within the city of Richmond, or providing significant subsidies to low income within the city of Richmond. In order to do that, we would have to advance the, uh, the past program for public schools, the security around it. We would have more staffing to deploy those cards, manage them, and to replace them, and to account for any fraud that might happen with the loss of those cards. Um, and as an account-based system does have stored value on the cards, and we would be deploying those across the, the region, um, people's uh, information will be tied to, and funds will be tied to their cards. We need more customer support staffing to be able to help people manage their account when they lose a card or when they switch cards or consolidate cards, and there's additional costs there. When we look at the technology associated with these three different systems, and I should actually say two different systems because there's almost no technology left for zero fare. Um, the, the current fare system, software and maintenance, is, was about 350. The TVMs, which is the ticket vending machines, which we have at each of the pulse stations, uh, they have a useful life of about 14 years, and they're about $55,000 each. When we go to account-based system, we need to be able to get those cards, the account-based cards, into more people's hands, have them um, be able, more places for them to purchase the cards and reload the cards, which means more TVMs around the region. The fare boxes on our buses are about $17,000 each. Again, their expected life is 14 years. As we expand our system, um, we do look forward to the time when we are able to expand with the CBTA dollars. We would need more buses, more fare collection, so that will increase those costs proportionately. Uh, we also know that for an account-based system, the technology and the deployment of itself still needs some, some final implementation. There's costs associated with that. And the point of sale, while we can use TVMs for some portion of the getting the cards out to people's hands, what we also know is that we would need kiosks and sales of those stored value cards at local supermarkets and pharmacies and other areas to allow people to get those cards off, um, off the buses so that they have them when they get on the buses. So anywhere that we, our system goes, we need to make sure we deploy those kiosks around the region, and that is a very significant expense. The, these last two costs were, were those costs that were actually developed by our team prior to COVID. They probably need to be updated. Now the operations itself, there's, there's, this is a, a, has a little bit of an interesting effect that we, I'm going to skip the route efficiency and the, for time needed to collect and do a boarding for a second and come back to that and start with fair enforcement. When I first arrived, there was some controversy over the effectiveness of our fair enforcement on the pulse. Um, when we go back, if we were to go back to 2019 fair systems, we would have to start that conversation again. Um, how do we make sure that we have effective fare enforcement when people are doing an off-board fare payment and they're getting on so that we come back? And it would probably need to expand because I think that what we were discussing pre-COVID is we needed a higher level of training for the, the fare enforcement officers. And we also needed to work with the city of Richmond on what kind of penalties should be imposed for people who didn't um, adhere to the fares. So we see a cost there that's a very conservative cost estimate. I suspect it's probably a little bit higher under account based because we would have more of that around the system and the sale of those cards and the collection of those cards. So it becomes a more complex and expensive problem to solve. Going back to the, the root efficiency, what we are already seeing under the zero fare system that we're operating under is that we have a higher efficiency of our route performance that uh, the, typically when someone gets on the bus, our bus, buses stay at each stop for a fairly um, moderate amount of time as people get on and they put their cash in or they tap and as operators then check to make sure their passes are valid, their reduced passes valid, that they have the correct ID to go with their senior passes or whatever passes they're using. Um, when we go to a uh, zero fare system, not only do we not have that in our system, we also have allow for dual door boarding. In September, as we move towards this route efficiency to, to stay in our system for at least this fiscal year, we're already expecting to see some um, compression of our routes to be able to save on that travel time to make our routes more efficient. Approximately, this will reduce our need 
by about 15 operators on the service that we put out every day. When you think about the cost of um, an annual cost of an operator plus the employment costs associated with them, the employer taxes, that's about $900,000 a year. Now, that's not really a savings to us because that's money that we would we immediately redeploy back in the system either to increase frequencies or increase expansion or just currently because of our operator shortage just keep our service going. But it is a, an interesting effect that's been noted across the country that when you go to zero fares, your entire uh, system becomes much more efficient and effective. Okay, so revenues. Um, that when we talk about the three different systems, the, the, we know that what the expenses are for the fare system. We know that the zero fare system, you, you remove nearly all of those expenses. And for the account-based system, we know that we increase a lot of expenses to deploy that kind of system. But what are the revenues that we were able to get back? Under the fare system, we showed in a prior slide how much money that we, we were getting back from our fare box. Uh, what this slide does is it pulls out of the Richmond and Ranko and Chesterfield. Those are lower than what you saw in the prior slide because it pulls out the VCU contribution to each of those modes down to the, the, the table on the bottom. So this is the expected fare box revenue in 2019 from each jurisdiction. Um, it also shows that so you see um, the three jurisdictions and then that fourth column is actually a total of the three above it. The line below the annual care service that's the amount of revenue that came from the paratransit service in Richmond and in RICO. Um, it doesn't include paratransit service in Chesterfield because that service didn't begin until 2020 with the implementation of the Chesterfield uh, Route 111. Now under zero fare, of course, none of those fares are collected. We need an alternate form of, of, of fare revenues in another place. Under the account-based system, you'll see that there's an asterisk under the Richmond fare box. Now here, this is an assumption that may or may not hold true, but the assumption is, is that the city of Richmond, um, should they proceed with the, the idea of zero fares within city limits, which is not a foregone conclusion, but a conversation that was had, then that assumes that we would no longer have fares in city of Richmond. That they, we would have another source, maybe from the city of Richmond itself, to subsidize those, um, that lost revenue. That decreases the fare box revenue uh, in total. It also decreases the care uh, service within the city of Richmond, which is why you see a reduction there and just the in RICO portion of, of care service. The columns below that show the annual business revenues that we get from, um, from our partners, including VCU. And then you see at the very, very bottom that federal relief dollars in order to make zero fares work we did have that federal subsidy, the federal relief dollars of $5.6 million in our current year budget. And that's very, very important to note that that is not an, a sustainable source of funding for zero fares. So revenues from the fare system, 2019, about 8 million. These are rounded numbers in FY 2022. In our budget, about $6.7 million. Under the account-based fare, assuming that Richmond uh, residents are not paying fare box revenue, it's about 2.7. Now the rough cost analysis to, to bring this home is that top column fare enough revenues, that's the, those are the numbers that we just talked about. Uh, the expenses, those are the ones we went through in the prior slides. The annual capitalized costs, those are the TVMs and fare boxes over 14 years um, divided by 14, so you have an annualized cost. Our fare system net fare box is the number we've talked about. Uh, is about 6.5 for in 2019. In 2022, the net fare box is very very similar um, because we have some reductions in um, fares, but we all uh, we have reductions in expenses, but we're making up that difference through that implementation of federal money, that 5.6 billion dollars of federal money. And then the account based, we have a net fare box loss. However, coming to the bottom line, the assumption there, of course, is that when you look at how much more we would need to implement the account based system in FY23, the assumption is that even though that's $7.8 million, the assumption is, is that Richmond would then come in with that $4.6 million 
for their citizens to supplement it. So there's a lot still to be studied in that model. There are a lot of assumptions there, but those are the conversations that have been have that that have happened over the past year and a half. And obviously, we need to still consider and study what are those assumptions are valid and how we move forward with these three different possibilities. And if there if there are other possibilities out there for our region. Um, a lot of this conversation does pivot around the case for or against zero fare. So I'm going to spend a couple of slides here talking and focusing on that specifically. But really what we are talking about is we're talking about a fare system that may or may not be zero fare. It might be account-based fare or old fare system. But this is just addressing some of the specific comments that have come up over the past year and, and honestly across the country that are focused on what are the pros and cons of zero fare. Um, the first and probably, I think there are probably two very most important to me, I, I believe, issues associated with the case against zero fare is one of the ones we just showed. It does create a budget hole. Uh, there is no denying it. When you go zero fare, you have to find a way to replace the money that you're no longer getting from the fare box. Currently, we're doing that with our federal relief dollars. If we do move forward with the state pilot we would need a local match to be able to apply for that successfully. And when that ends, how is that continued um, beyond that? That's a question that still remains to be answered. Uh, there are other issues associated with we should collect from um, the white collar workers, the telework workers. Well, we know we really weren't collecting from them anyway. We were collecting from businesses. And we, we need to be considering how we engage with businesses to have them pay us directly in the future anyway. Um, so those are, those are some of the relevant conversations for zero fare. Uh, some more is that the conversation about when you take money and you put it into zero fare, couldn't that money, instead of going into zero fare, keep collecting from our passengers and use that same money to have higher frequency and broader coverage? Um, I'm not sure that that's necessarily a valid argument uh, for us because the, the money that we're looking at for zero fares is likely not going to come to us under any other umbrella. We have money that we expect or we know is coming in from CBTA that will allow us to do higher frequency and broader coverage that is dedicated specifically to that and only that. It's for our existing system and the higher frequency. Um, the money that we were looking at and applying for that could go towards maintaining zero fare either temporarily or permanently would be its own dedicated source. So that is a debate that people across the country are, are struggling with. And uh, probably, to me, one of the ones that uh, also is the biggest one that I think impacts riders and operators and agencies across the country, and the ones that jurisdictions struggle with the most. Once you address the issue of funding, even if you get past the funding, some of the social issues that most almost all cities have start encroaching onto the, the bus system when you reduce the barrier of having to pay to ride. You, uh, you increase the number of homeless that might use it. Um, people who might have mental health issues who might not otherwise have the means to, to use transit now can use it because it is zero fare. Um, you have some issues with maybe people sleeping on the bus and joyriding. Now, while many of these can be addressed, and many of them we already are addressing proactively by working with the police and working with social services and working with training with our operators, implementing policies to prevent joyriding. Um, but what we're seeing is that these are issues that are not transit issues. They are social issues that transit must address under a zero fare policy. And in the past, when in the 80s and 90s, when zero fare became pilots across the country in different areas, Many times when these issues came forward into transit, the transit agency was unable to, to manage it. So that, that was a contributing cause to the failure of prior zero fare pilots in prior years and prior uh, other areas of the country. The case for zero fare, um, there, there are a lot of good cases for zero fare that balance this. One is that there was a study that was done in Kansas City. They're already going zero fare. They were looking at it pre-COVID is that they did a study that showed that of all the dollars from the local bus riders that were paying for cash and one-ride fares, that when they weren't putting those dollars into the fare box, they weren't saving them. Uh, they needed those money. They immediately reused that money back into the local economy. 
for food or for going to restaurants or for education or to pay their rent or to pay their utilities, that money immediately went back into the local GDP. And that study, which I think was uh, highly optimistic, I believe, showed the return as a two to one. So a much greater return to the GDP as what was lost in the fare box. I think that that warrants further study here to see whether or not the, the assumptions made in that model would also be uh, relevant here. But it, it, even if you say, okay, it was off by half, it's still a one-to-one -one return. It also shows a, a very strong signal to businesses that you're an economy that supports your workforce and you're an economy where you can come and it provides a, a means for people to get to your business more effectively and efficiently. Other cases for zero fare is that things that we're already seeing right now that we saw when GRTC implemented zero fares when they did the pulse implementation and the, the transit redesign, we saw a double digit increase in ridership. We saw the efficiencies. Um, we're seeing that again now under COVID where across the country, agencies are struggling to regain their ridership and looking for strategies. We're not we're actually going to st soon be struggling to figure out how to accommodate all the people who are riding. We have stories over and over from uh, RVA Rapid Transit and from our ridership of both the differences made to low-income populations who have been able to use it during COVID to access jobs, access healthcare, access food. But I'm also getting a lot of comments coming to me personally from people who are white-collar workers who are traveling and tourists who have come to this region and have used it because it's free where they might not normally have gone to as many restaurants or many places they might have driven around, they access transit and they access it frequently with very good results where they might not have before. So we know that uh, Zero Fare has a very high success rate in increasing accessibility and increasing ridership as well as reducing our own costs and our efficiencies. Okay, that was the background. So what does that mean? Where do we go now? Uh, we do have the reason why there's so much focus on this zero fares concept and specifically is because there's this state pilot that there's an application we have to, um, a deadline that's coming up, I believe it's September 17th. I might be off by a day, to, day or two. I've got it written on one of my notes. Um, we, can, we have done zero fares because of the safety implications associated with COVID of getting our riders backdoor boarding um, eliminating the touch point that the face-to-face -face interaction of our operators and our passengers as people are, are paying their fares. So that's been really incredibly important to use those federal dollars to maintain zero fares under COVID. Now, as we start to look what happens post-COVID, uh, DRPP has a state grant that is, uh, like I said, it's coming out. It's expected that there's at least $10 million in the FY22 state budget for that. There may be more uh, in future years. This is what has been communicated publicly to date. Uh, and it is intended primarily for agencies in the state to be able to pilot zero fares or low income pilot fares over a multi-year period. Uh, it's not for jurisdictions, it's for transit agencies or transit agencies um, that are embedded within a single jurisdiction. We know that uh, when we look at zero fares and we see the ridership increases that we are experiencing, we should expect to see increases in our state and federal formula funds that are associated with that ridership post-COVID as long as we stay zero fares because that's a natural increase over a couple of years when we look at the, the nat National Transit Database, NTD data, and the state data, higher ridership usually means higher federal and state support. So we should see that in the next couple of years increasing into our budget. And as we look at, at whether or not this should be maintained, if, we're, if we are going to maintain it, it will probably be very essential that we look at how we um, use our federal formula funds for preventative maintenance and capital grants to kind of balance our revenue sources effectively. We need to be looking at other ways to advertise. I know you just saw the benches, but do we need to even talk further about how can we advertise on benches? They do it in Nashville, they do it in, in Hampton Roads. There's opportunities there that we're missing on our buses, on our shelters to self-generate revenue. Um, and so we need to look at different sources of revenue that can help support our system, whether it's through zero fares or otherwise. Um, 
Other zero fare pilot considerations that are very important before this board takes action is to understand that the application we're considering is um, a multi-year application. Uh, it is for system-wide use of zero fares. Um, and it would require some level of a local partner match. And we have no committed local partner at this time. So what, when we're looking at a need of about $5.5 million a year over three years, the grant application we're looking at uh, currently is we're looking to ask for approximately $8 million, split over that three years, 4 and a half to 2 and a half to $1 million. Uh, the state grant is set up so that it has to be a descending amount year over year. Uh, we would then be looking sometime over this next few weeks to months for a local partner to make the commitment to the delta, the one million, three million, and four and a half million escalating over three years, so that by the time 2026 comes, if we're still in the pilot, that local partner would then step forward uh, with five and a half million offset by whatever self-generated revenues we, or business partnerships we'd be able to get. Now, the other side of that is that there are exit ramps throughout this entire process um, that if at any point in time, as we're studying zero fares and as we're studying also other fare mechanisms, we find that we want to shift course or that the state money um, does not isn't able to continue multi-year or the local money is not able to continue multi-year, even though the, the commitment might come, things change from year to year, uh, there's off ramps, safe exit ramps where we could go back to our existing fare system or if we're far enough along in studies, go to an account-based fare system. So um, there are ways that we'll be looking at all the different aspects. Um, I'm almost done. Uh, other considerations that we need to look at is the use of federal relief dollars. So I talked about doing a lot of studies while we're staying zero fare. The recommendation that I would make to the board is that if we are successful in getting the, the state grant that we would also, and getting a, a local partner to match it, that we would also use federal relief dollars and other dollars associated with, um, with discretionary grants to study those alternative fare technologies for low income and for fare capping. Look at maybe is there a, a mobility technology that we can maintain for um, non-traditional transit services as we look at micro transit and on-demand and more premium services and we also need to make sure that we study our current ridership patterns and tra travel patterns under zero fare to understand how they've shifted pre-COVID and post-COVID. We also uh, need to look at trying to leverage dollars to support those social services and security issues so that we can help to partner with our, our local jurisdictions and our local nonprofits and our local um, community services to support the social issues and the security issues that are systemic in almost every region across the United States that have come onto our system. And we need to consider how we use our current fare system. We also need to study the economic impacts of zero fare, whether or not the assumptions that, are, have, that other, um, other jurisdictions across the country have made about the economics of zero fare service actually prove true here in a post-COVID environment. So there's a lot to consider and a lot to study uh, as we look forward to a zero possible zero fare pilot. Now, if I can stop share for a second and then reshare one more screen here. Um, this is a lot to discuss and I, um, the, at the, the, before I, I stop talking and, and the, I sent just prior to the board meeting, and it will come out publicly right now. Um, I just wanted you, you to be able to have it on your screen. We do have a proposed resolution from staff to the board to ask for the board to support us applying for the Transit Ridership Incentive Program of the RPT. Um, I'd like to go through the points of that resolution and, um, and discuss those. My question to the board is, would you like me to go through those points now, or do you want to have a little bit of discussion about the presentation before we go into the resolution? I'd like to go in and get the resolution up and get somebody to offer it so that that can be the basis of our conversation. Um, okay. Thank would you, you do that, please? Yes, sir. So on the screen, you should see the, um, can, can, I, can, I, is, can I get a thumbs up that you can see the, the 
um, the Word document. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to, I hate reading the screen, but I'm going to go ahead and do that for our viewers at home who may or may not have um, an easy ability to, to read on their screen if they're, if they're watching on something smaller than a full scale monitor. The resolution as it is currently drafted for board consideration states to express the Greater Richmond Transit Company's Board of Directors support for a GRTC grant application for Transit Ridership Incentive Program, zero fare and low income projects, in quotes, funding through the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. And that's the purpose of the resolution. Whereas, pursuant to Chapter 1230 of the Acts of Assembly of 2020, the General Assembly enacted the Transit Ridership Incentive Program, the TRIP program, and whereas the TRIP program was developed by the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation and approved by the Commonwealth Transportation Board, the application process opened on August 1st of 2021 and closes on September 17th, 2021, and all supplemental data is due by October 1, 2021, and Whereas the TRIP program is a statewide pro grant program whose purpose is to improve regional transit connectivity in urban areas and reduce barriers to public transit through low income and zero fare programming. And whereas the TRIP program focuses on urban metropolitan areas with populations of 100,000 or more, which includes the GRTC service area. And Whereas other Virginia localities and transit agencies are considering the extension of free fare or zero fare policies post COVID-19, including the cities of Alexandria, Charlottesville, Lynchburg, and Roanoke, there are others. And whereas GRTC believes there is a need for further study of the social and economic impact of fare collection systems, including zero fare option operations on GRTC's current service population. And Whereas GRTC must obtain commitment from one or more local partners to match state pilot funding under the TRIPS grant application, and whereas GRTC must explore and define additional sources of funding for all potential future fare collection systems prior to permanent implementation of any, and whereas the Richmond City Council passed a resolution stating its belief that it is in the best interest of the citizens of the city of Richmond that the council supports the Greater Richmond Transit Company's application for the TRIP program through the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation for the purpose of maintaining the Greater Richmond Transit Company's current zero fare policy. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Greater Richmond Transit Company Board of Directors that the GRTC Board of Directors hereby supports the Greater Richmond Transit Company's application for the TRIP program through the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transport for the purpose of maintaining the Greater Richmond Transit Company's current zero fare policy while studying social and economic impact of various fare collection systems. That's, that's good, uh, Julie. Is there anybody who'd be prepared to just uh, move this so we Don't can move. get it on the table? Thank you. Don't Is there move. a second? Is there a second, please? Anybody second that to get it on the table? You can vote against I'll it. I'll second it. Want. Okay, so it's on the table, and um, I think every we've all been working on this. If anybody's listening to the show other than us, we've all been really studying this, um, and people need to know that uh, this isn't the first time we've heard these conversations. So uh, let's let's talk to one another. Who'd like to make some comments on this? Questions? Yeah, Eldridge. Yeah. Uh... Julie, have anybody did a study on environmental effect on zero fare as far as uh, how many cars are being taken off the street or not on the roads because people are using the uh, zero fare to uh, ride the buses? I, I'm unfamiliar if other areas have done studies of that prior. That would certainly be something we would probably want to consider looking at. Right now, um, what we're seeing on our system is while we are seeing, uh, we're seeing a higher increase of people who use transit in the past, use it more for their needs. So I'm not sure that at this time, under COVID, 
that we're necessarily seeing a reduction in car use on our local service. I think we're seeing an increased use of it because we've reduced that barrier. However, moving forward after yes. COVID, I do believe that that would be a relevant thing to study and that we would see that reduction in um, automotive use and that there are many people have said that they've, uh, I think there's an article in the paper who even said the gentleman who doesn't have his vehicle anymore is using transit now. And when he's able to buy a car again, he may or may not. It really depends on the effectiveness and efficiency of our service moving forward. So there's, there, there, it's a good question that we don't have a specific answer for. I think our gut tells us that it would reduce uh, uh, cars on the road and therefore be an improvement to emissions. But we would need to study that to get better data. Safe parking spaces in the downtown yes. area. There, that's actually part of the, the part of the business case for this is mm -hmm. that if we have better connectivity for businesses as they come in, they should need a reduced number of spaces for employees. So it reduces their cost as well. There's a, a significant amount of cost. I remember when I was a consultant, the businesses would um, the amount of money they had to pay for each of us has a parking spot, whether they built it or rented it, was extraordinary. Um, and so many of them did look for ways to try and subsidize people to move over to transit so they could minimize those costs. Thank you. Who else? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I support this and I wanted to be the one to um, move this resolution. And one of the reasons is it seems that we're right now in a period of thinking again about a lot of things that we consider to be very uh, much conventional knowledge in the past. And, you know, really when you go in and look at the expenses um, that we um, incur to, in, in essence, create a regressive tax on, uh, on people who um, need something. Um, we're not in the position where we are saying, okay, every time a police officer shows up for a public, uh, public safety issue, you have to pay you know, a dollar fifty or what have you. Um, we're not at you know we're not at the point where we're we're doing something along that. Uh, public transportation is really just should be essential, um, and and I, I just believe that um, this is just something that um, we need to be progressive about. We need to think again about how we're. Um, you know, approaching uh, these things and thinking about the expenses. I mean, we we all still have um, PTSD over our fair enforcement um, of the pulse when it started. Um, you know, let, let, let's not go back there. Let's not go back to, you know, um, throwing dollars at nonsense, um, you know, and, and, you know, let's, let's, let's move forward with this and, and give our partners in the, um, cities and counties an, an opportunity to um, see, you know, how we can make this a reality for our, all RVA. Um, I, I don't have any questions. Um, I think they've all been answered over the several months um, with this. I just <clears throat> wanted to soapbox for a minute because I just think this is really essential to, um, you know, making RVA one of the you know, first class, um, Metropolitan areas in this country. Thank you. Other comments? Chair? Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I agree with George uh, in terms of why this would be important for us to take advantage of. Um, obviously, the cost to collect revenue, the cost of future technology to, to create what we think is efficiency in the collection of revenue, obviously is not as efficient as we thought around, you know, technology taking care of all that. So I think Julie does a great job of kind of level setting all of that for us. For those, you know, obviously for those representing Chesterfield County, you know, we wanna make sure as part of this process that, you know, our, our partner that we represent understands what's going on with the zero fare piece. So I'll. I do want to make sure that this is communicated well with them. And if we need to take time to do that, I think that would be beneficial to the decision-making process on this. Just Thank you. Uh, Gary, you froze there for a second. 
um, after the word decision making process. Uh, you are frozen. You, it's possible that if, when he's frozen, he can, also can't hear us speaking okay. back. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I might add um, uh, any Take advantage of I a little, am I still going out? You're in now, we hear you now. Okay, all right, well, real quickly, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to ask the board to consider allowing us to make sure this presentation is presented to our partners, uh, particularly Chesterfield, to make sure that they understand what we are actually voting for. This is a complicated topic and the numbers behind it are complicated. So <clears throat> I'd like to throw that out there to the board as well. I seconded it because I wanted to have this conversation, but I want us to consider that as well. I agree with you, Kerry. Um, say more, uh, Danny. I should say, I, I agree with you. Our partners in, in terms of Chesterfield need to understand this. Um, so we have a, a good feeling for this as we move forward. How do we do that? Well, I think to me, Ben, um, part of it is just dividing the presentation and the discussion on zero fare versus the resolution itself. Um, I think I've got a lot of questions which are natural about the presentation because the analysis hasn't been completed yet. Um, so we can dig into some of those too and, and kind of where I'm at on the analysis um, and questions I have based on the presentation um, versus wanting to make sure that we can take advantage of almost a once in a lifetime opportunity with this grant application at the same time. Um, so figuring out a way that we can um, go through the presentation and the analysis and some of the things that were said there while still being able to move forward and take advantage of this, again, this, this grant that uh, may never come back. Um, I think it's important because of the deadline with the grant that we have as much discussion as we can about it right now. Um, and if there is a way to move forward a resolution that just supports, you know, trying to obtain additional funding while we continue our analysis, um, then that could uh, that could be something that we can at least discuss and how we can we can move forward with that, if that makes sense. What do you want us to do, Ian? I think right now, if we can go through some of the the, the presentation that Julie had and kind of talk through those points let's and make sure it. that we, under, we understand those. No, um, and we it. also understand where we may need that future analysis. Um, and then I think that the way the resolution is, is written, um, it's understood that this hopefully is, is just taking advantage of, of state funding um, and then trying to find the, the local partner to, to move forward with it. Um, but if you want, I can start going through some of my questions that I had about the analysis or- Yeah, please do. To... Um, I would say that the resolution is very clear that this thing does not go forward without uh, a local partner or partners pledging um, to supplement the, uh, the state funding. Uh, it just doesn't happen, um, can't, can't move forward. The state requires that. Yeah, let's go Mr. for Chairman, it, Ian. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, members of the yes. board, would it be helpful if I reshared the, the presentation for these questions or do you think it's not necessary? I think, I think it probably would be helpful. I know there's at least yeah. one slide I, I want to talk about in particular, um, but the, the first thing in the, uh, in the board action item, we talk about a significant shift in the understanding um, of the use of transit system by essential and low wage workers. And I kind of wanted to go through what that shift was. What did we think about um, the use of the system by essential and low wage workers pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic? Um, I know that uh, the express routes really fell off, but I guess if anything, instead of being a significant shift, it actually concreted my thought and philosophy that the essential workers um, and, and low income workers were the ones that are, are using our system um, and uh, it's vital to, uh, to, to them. So if I can, I can address that. Um, and I think that part of that is that um, it shifted significant. It shifted it significantly for me. I, I'm the one that wrote the item. So I uh, just to clarify that the board item itself, the background is where that language of, of appeared that said that there was a significant shift in our understanding. And when it, that part of it is staff talking to board, versus the action item is your resolution, which is your voice speaking. So the significant shift isn't meant to suggest that. The board had a significant shift so much as it was meant to say that um, staff and myself had a significant shift. And a lot of it is based on when 
when faced with this data and faced with um, with this, I think it concrete might be a better word to say that there's some things that we intuitively knew, but really when we look at here and at this slide in particular, this is where I had that aha shift where I knew it, but there's a difference between kind of knowing it and just being in your face knowing it. And this slide in particular, when this came up in uh, May of 2020, about where our ridership continued to stay high compared to the economic distressed areas and looking at those incomes and seeing that when COVID hit, the riders didn't have that choice to stay home. They didn't have those options. Uh, it, it was altering for me. And when I presented this to other people, I have uh, heard them express a similar altering of their perceptions around transit and the uh, the impact of transit on our, our community. Does that help to answer that question? So what happened specifically is that um, <clears throat> we already had the data that said that um, more than 50% of our riders had household incomes of 25,000 a year or less. And, and over 75% had household incomes of 50,000 a year or less. Secondly, we had this information that suggested that um, our persons with the lowest incomes are least able to take advantage of our uh, fare reduction systems like weekly passes or monthly passes. So <clears throat> what, and then we discovered that by the fact that the ridership held up when it was being used only for essential rides, we came to the conclusion that 25, that 50% of our riders who were earning household incomes of 25,000 a year or less were in fact essential workers in the system. Um, and, and the cost of about $1,000 a year for those persons on a $25,000 a year income um, was just stunning to us. And I think, Ian, I think that's what you and I were we're noting in this thing and that we've reacted to. Is that right? Yeah, that, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. Um, like you said, Ben, I, I think that um, and, and Julie, you know, kind of mentioned it too. It's really is putting right in our face what we already kind of intrinsically understood that that the Richmond system is different than a lot of transit systems in other cities where it is heavily used by essential workers, low income um, uh, families to uh, provide mobility. Um, and now it's it's very evident um, and very clear to everybody that uh, that that's the case. Um, one th other thing I wanted to go into more detail on, I believe it's the uh, the revenue slide that you had, Julie. There we go. Um, for this one, one of the things that I, I think we need to definitely dig into as we're performing this analysis is to analyze <laughs> the, the various fare systems um, in the same element. Um, right now, we're looking at 2019 pre-pandemic for the, uh, the, the fare system um, as it was before. We're looking at FY22 for the zero fare, which adds the $5.6 billion or $5.6 million bump for the federal money. Um, and then we're looking at account base in FY23 after the federal money is gone. Um, so I think that we need to very strongly look at how we analyze it to make sure that we're analyzing each of the systems apples to apples. Um, and that we look at it to make sure we know exactly what the revenue is for um, each system, either at a point in time where there is federal aid or a point in time where there's not federal aid, um, I think will give us a, um, a, a better apples to apples comparison. So we really understand what the, uh, the, the revenue sources would be for each. Yeah, there are, as we move forward, if this does pass, um, I'm gonna, <laughs> have a series of ifs. If the, the board does pass this resolution, if we are uh, successful in receiving a commitment from a local partner, um, and if the board also approves the use of some of our federal stimulus dollars to, to do some more studies in here. So lots of ifs that we're still working through. Um, one of those studies would be looking at the, uh, these, having an economist look at them, uh, put them in the same year dollars, looking at elasticity of our fares, looking at uh, when you put the account-based fare systems in, there's some other costs associated with it. We did a, we did a significant study uh, like this, not including zero fares, but a, a system versus account-based system in Nashville when I worked there. And um, it is a very complex study and they are able to put it in 
stamier dollars and putting a lot more assumptions and a lot more factors than I was able to introduce in this presentation or else it may have doubled the length, unfortunately. I agree with you, it needs a lot more analysis, but that analysis is complex and is not something that we can do in the next two weeks. But we should, I concur, we, we should do as much of apples to apples as we can, knowing that we can't have all three systems running at the same time to compare them at the same time. No, sure, absolutely. Um, one other thing while we're on this slide for the zero fare system and the 1.1 million for the annual pass revenue, I assume is that um, from VCU essentially or? Yes, yes. Is there, is there, have there been discussions with VCU about an appetite for continuing their, their contract with us in a zero fare environment? There, there has been a conversation with them. Um, and I don't have, again, a, a written commitment from them, but the, the conversation they've had is that they see the value of a zero fare system to them and to their, their, um, their riders and their students. What they, I hate to speak out of turn here prior to allowing them to speak for themselves, but I think they have a fair concern that they don't want to be the only local partner that's contributing to it. They would want to see us advance a, a, a system if we do go zero fare, where others are also contributing other businesses, you know, the, a, a local partner, at least one other major local partner, are, are also contributing to the system. And I think that's a very fair position for them to take. Mr. Pope, Mr. Chair, I, yes, I apologize, but I need to depart here uh, simply to say that everything we're talking about, there's still a lot of questions to be asked and, and things to be considered. But in theory, I'm, I'm in favor of this motion uh, and hope that maybe we can work through all these and, and have a good sense of both not only us, but the uh, partners to understand that the value in doing this. Um, so I apologize, I need to leave. You need to go now, Danny? Yes, I do, and I apologize. Yeah. Okay, uh, would it be all right? Um, I mean, the motion basically says uh, we apply and then we study if we get it. Uh, it has to have has to have money pledged by somebody, um, uh, and then we study for whatever period of time it exists. Is that? I mean, that's the studying. And what what else should we do? Something before that? Well, I think talking about what happens if the grant's not received or we don't get the full amount that we're expecting and, and all that type of stuff too, I, I think having that understanding um, and just kind of talking through that, we really haven't gone through that yet. No, so we, have not we, got, we have not uh, said, what do we do um, right. if zero fare ends with the end of uh, CARES Act money and um, and we, re we have to reinstitute something. So, um, and that of course, uh, Julie, uh, Ms. Tim would be a good thing to uh, to work up for us. Um, and I would say that at this point, um, considering the amount of time it takes, uh, when I saw at Nashville, it took them years to study and implement an account-based system. If we did not, we weren't able to proceed with the zero fare study and the, the studies during that time, the counter would be that in FY23, fares would come back under our old system and that the, the board would be able to consider possible use of dollars to study future implementation of account-based fares. So it wouldn't mean it's precluded, but um, at this moment, the likely scenario is that if we do not move forward with this, the alternative would be to go back to our normal fare system at the end of the COVID relief dollars, whenever that is. Uh, and concurrently, while we're in the process of trying to study and see if it makes sense to, to do a conversion over and then to set aside zero fares. It's just a non-starter for this region. Okay. I must leave, I'm sorry. Thanks, Danny. Good discussion. Yeah. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes. So Julie, I, and maybe Ian touched on this. The, the state has budgeted $10 million for this year for this study. And I guess that covers however many transit agencies may want to take advantage of it. Is that, is that correct? That dollar amount that we might get from that might be very different depending on what other agencies apply for it. That is, that is correct. Um, we are the third largest transit agency in the state. 
I believe that we are the largest agency, to my knowledge, that's applying for it, so we would have likely the largest need. Um, but there is a cap on how much they can support. Um, I don't know how much flexibility they have to change that based on how the legislation was passed um, and what the CTB would allow and what applications come in. I, I, those are just questions I can't answer. Yeah, so it's possible that we may be looking for a local you know, a local partner to help fund this, but we might not even know how much that is for a while. Is that true? I would say that it, that is a fair consideration. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. I, I don't know that it really changes that much, but it is a little bit of a concern as we head into decision making on, you know, how this may go, particularly with a partner who may want to help fund it. Yeah, I, I think that it's it's important to know that. The state grant application does require a local partner, um, one of the local jurisdictions or more of the local jurisdictions to partner on this. However, uh, if we were to also have other business partners or other nonprofit partners who wanted to participate, that would of course certainly be a welcome contribution to showing the region's support for different transit opportunities. Right. So what impresses me here is uh, first, if we're going to take a shot at learning about this, this is the time um, be, for two reasons. One is we're doing it. Um, and two is um, the state's offering grant money. And uh, otherwise, uh, so this, if it's either continue to look at it or not. The second thing that's just really st stunned me is that that data point that we looked at. They, we provide free roads for people who can afford cars. But when we get people who are so poor that they cannot afford cars, we then charge them for their transportation. Um, although the same sales tax in the CBTA is being used for both the roads and for the public transportation. And it, it just seems kind of ironic um, to me. I, I looked up some data because it interested me. 40% of the uh, households in Richmond, Henrico, and Chesterfield have one car or no car. 75% um, of those in Chesterfield have two or more. Um, and um, in, in Henrico, 60% have two or more. In the city of Richmond, um, there are actually 16% of households who have no car whatsoever. And they're actually 7.4% um, in those three jurisdictions that have no car whatsoever. When you have one car, that means that if you have two people who need to work or a person who needs to work and a person who needs to go to school, that person needs um, public transportation as well. Mm -hmm. So we're in a situation where to have a healthy system, uh, we, we've got to address it. I think this is a good time to study this. And there are lots of problems with it and issues with it. Um, but we don't have any better time to do this. The other thing that's convincing to me is that the city council of Richmond by an eight to one vote um, said they were really interested in pursuing this. And um, I haven't had the city of Richmond city council come out with that kind of initiative on public transit for some time. So I think that's important for us to- Mr. To Chairman, mm -hmm. if, if I might um, add a correction, a slight correction is that the city of Richmond was unanimous in support. It was uh, the eight to one was that eight of the nine members co-patroned the resolution. I see, but thank all you. all nine passed it unanimously. Okay. Other comments, friends? Ben, I'll just, I'll just go back to my original comment of, um, you know, I'm in support of this. Um, I agree with certainly the way George framed it and certainly your comments, Mr. Chair. Um, I think what I would ultimately want in supporting this would be to make sure that we do get a presentation out to Chesterfield after this vote and make sure they really understand what we're talking about here and, um, and that, you know, who knows how they may react, uh, maybe positively. So, well, how do but, we do that, Gary? Because I think all of us think that's I a good I don't think we idea. have to vote. I mean, we can vote. I'm yeah. just saying. I'd like to make sure Julie gets out there Good. this month or so to get to to show them what's going on with this concept. Yeah, I think you know um, 
this we're all learning about this and um I, obviously that'd be great uh, so yes. Julie, we got that right mr chairman members of the board um i understand that the board of supervisors is extremely uh, busy right now with schools opening and uh, and their driver shortage and other issues going on. If they feel that they need that extra amount of information after this board meeting, I would be pleased to present to them. If they feel like this presentation gave them everything they needed, um, then I would be pleased to support them as they see fit. Yeah, that's good. great. Other comments? Does the resolution as it's currently written need anything about the um, the local funding support in it? Just well, we've got a whereas, uh, which says that essentially we can't do it without without local funding support. I mean, we could switch that to the to a resolve, or we can just leave it as a whereas. Whereas GRTC must obtain commitment from one or more local partners to match state pilot funding under the TRIPS grant application. So, um, okay, it it we it acknowledges the fact that we can't make the application without the local funding. Gotcha. That is yeah. th these two areas here. Okay. I think that I think legally that'll that'll cover and, us. And so that that means that we will get a local match and potentially even higher than the match if we don't get the full funding that we need from DRPT. Um, that the intention would be that if we are successful in uh, this next couple of weeks and getting a local match um, in the amount that I'm requesting. And if DRPT then comes in at less than we need to make that full amount, that we would have to then look at other funding sources to fill the gap again. The conversation's ongoing. I think it, it's, I just wanna repeat what I said before is that there's multiple, there are multiple avenues to exit, to off ramp out of this process if for some reason the funding's not there. Um, that, that while we are we would be committing to, to the study and committing to and re resolving that this is an important moment for GRTC to consider these issues uh, at any point in time in the next three years we don't we don't have crystal ball if we need to off ramp we can gotcha and that, that's good because I know that my biggest thing I'm trying to understand is how the gap gets filled like we mentioned if there is zero fares there is some type of a gap. Um, that gap over the past 18 months has been filled by CARES Act. Um, moving forward, if that gap is going to be filled by uh, the DRPT grant plus a local contribution, and then making sure that once that DRPT grant is dissolved in FY25, uh, that we have a plan moving forward for filling that gap. And it looks like that gap increases each year um, that, the, that we have the grant. So that identifying that local contribution in those amounts that you mentioned is going to be significant. That, that's a significant amount of money for any of our local partners to do. It is. And Julie, and my understanding I... is that um, not only in the application, not only do we look at the first year, but we have to look at, um, at filling the gap for the three years has to be specified in the application. So it's a, yes. um, yeah. And that was, that was, that was a challenge for DRPT, I believe. I, I heard uh, that there were many localities who expressed concern over the multi-year aspect of the grant application, that while it's not required that the way it was structured is to be that, that uh, city councils usually can't obligate future years and future city councils. Uh, so they understand that that is an issue, which is one of the reasons why there, there are these off-ramps. Um, that you enter into it and should there be a change in policy, a change in direction, um, a change in funding priorities that they understand that what they want is they wanna hear the resolution of commitment, um, knowing that we're going to do everything we can to, to keep studying this, but knowing that there, there's a possibility that things happen. Right, no one predicted COVID. Uh, hopefully we never face anything like that again, but we do need to understand that this isn't a permanent and final action. It's a, a path mm -hmm. forward that might result in uh, a, a final solution of zero fares, or it might result in a final solution of something we can't even foresee yet, but it allows us the opportunity to access the grant money, to have all those paths available to us for consideration. And 
honestly, it, 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 I will, I think I said during the presentation, and I want to reiterate that it, it will be, um, I am looking forward to having conversations with our local partners as to whether or not they have the funding to support this because there isn't a guarantee that one or more of our local partners has the available funding to support this with all their other local priorities. If that's not available, then we want to bend. And just on that note for a clarification of the resolution, Julie, um, I know it says that the city of Richmond um, supports the application. That's not a commitment of financial support. That is just a support of filling out the application itself. That is correct. Okay. There, we have, I have, to be very clear, I have not received a firm commitment of financial support. Other questions? Um, I, I just want to clarify. It's um, a few minutes ago, Julie said um, the locality is having the funds. Um, not to correct, but just to clarify, it's really, it's just, will the localities prioritize um, public transportation to the point that they can make the funds available for this? Um, I think we can all, all see and, and, and look at everybody else's uh, budgets and find ways to fund the things we want, but it's really a matter of their prioritization. And that's really what um, this will ultimately come down to. Um, not for lack of dollars, but for, um, you know, lack or uh, lack of commitment, you know, to this particular effort. So um, I just say, you know, we move forward and we let the decisions uh, um, follow um, from this point. And I think to add on to that, I think GRTC, we need to look at those marketing dollar opportunities and those other things that we could partner with our partners around solving this this budget gap that we may have for for this this type of service so i'm i'm going to encourage julie and her team to take a really good hard look at what are we leaving on the table from a marketing standpoint advertising standpoint particularly as we do new new capital investment into you know benches and and shelters and that sort of thing and the, even the buses themselves what else can we do advertising wise to help cover this very important need. So I'll throw that to you as well, Julie. I would recommend that, um, that staff brings before the board in the next couple of months our advertising and sponsorship policy for further consideration. Okay. So I, th I think what's really um, solid about this is that it's a professional act by a, by a serious company um, that's, that's got some really strong staff leadership to look at to look on behalf of our of our uh, partners to look at at the possible ways of moving our system forward and um, taking advantage of a grant opportunity to do that. It's a genuine study. The resolution, if we pass it, deals with endorsing the application for the state grant contingent upon the availability of the proper availability of local match and also calls for a significant amount of study um, of, the, of what we learn from it and the different alternative ways of proceeding um, in once the three-year period is ended. It's a, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to look at something that transit companies, responsible transit companies all over the country are having to look at. Is there any further conversation? Are you ready to vote on this? Okay, um, it's been moved and seconded that the Board of GRTC um, supports the Greater Richmond Transit Company's application for the TRIP program through Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transport for the purpose of maintaining GRTC's current zero, zero fare policy while studying social and economic impacts of various co fare collection systems. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, the motion passes. Thank you very much. And thanks for the conversation. Um, uh, I think we're ready to move on to the next item of business, right? Uh, which is our, right, Cheryl has, yeah. Let's uh, see if we can move these uh, along. Cheryl, operations and maintenance report. 
Yes, good morning. We will have staff briefly discuss our operating performance for the month of July. We'll start with Mr. Tim Barham. Tim. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Briefly, the KPIs, uh, on time performance for fixed route, we're still around 65%. Uh, we're going to follow through and continue with the initiatives that I talked about in previous months. Uh, and next month on September the 12th, uh, during our schedule change, uh, there will be some adjustments made to some of the running times on some of the routes uh, that we've had some issues with in particular. So hopefully we'll see some positive dividends after that. Uh, lost time rate absenteeism did go up to about 18.73% uh, due to primarily uh, more people out for long-term illnesses and a rise in workers' comp cases. Uh, and as a result, lost time. Uh, had more than doubled uh, up to a little over 2,400 lost service uh, during the course of the month, mainly due to um, manpower shortages. Uh, but in charge of management, transportation, we're working to address um, any of those long time illnesses and so forth. Uh, and as a result, also customer complaints had gone up to about 39 ballot complaints for the past month. Uh, most of the complaints are a late bus or a bus didn't show. Uh, and so forth. So proportionately, as we had those operational challenges, uh, the complaints uh, were matched along with those lines. Uh, and with specialized, uh, we had a, a slight decrease in the on-time performance at around 89%. Uh, we've noticed that with specialized, uh, we do have an increase in their service, uh, as Julie mentioned and others. Uh, and you'll see uh, coming up from Emily, our ridership is you know, just about at or at pre-pandemic uh, levels uh, and specialized service is similar has a similar trend as well. So with that, we you know making sure that we stay on track and focused and working with First Transit and and what they can do to make sure that we maintain and get that on time performance back up to an acceptable level. Uh, complaints conversely uh, had gone up as well. Uh, similar issues, uh, more complaints, late service, uh, and, and so forth. But we did have seven accommodations uh, from specialized as well. Um, operators and, and customer service associates receive kudos for, uh, for their good service. Staffing, we're at 260 full-time, 19 part-time. Uh, three operators graduated back on June, July the 30th. Uh, we had eight operators to start August the 9th, so we're encouraged about those new uh, operators that are starting. Uh, and for COVID, uh, we had uh, 299 so far uh, employees, of roughly about 65% of our staff that have been fully vaccinated. Uh, so we're continuing to encourage our folks to, uh, to get the vaccine. Uh, and we still have some folks that are taking advantage of that. Uh, other than that, I, that's about as brief as I could keep the report. So unless there's any questions, that concludes my uh, operations report. Thank you, Tim. Uh, next we'll have Emily conduct the ridership performance. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I will be even more brief than Tim. Um, as Julie and Tim both mentioned, um, we are seeing uh, great increases in our ridership. Um, so I would call your attention to our total fixed route um, for the month of July. We're at 686,645 riders. Um, we're 6% up from last month and about 10% up from July 2020. Um, and as you can see, we are approaching our pre-COVID ridership for total fixed route. Um, but kind of the more exciting um, information that I'll hone in on is our local fixed route. Um, so we're at 546,000 um, for the month of July. Comparing that to last month, we're up 5%. Um, and comparing it to last year, July 2020, we're up 7%. Um, but the most exciting piece of information um, we're um, within one percentage point, um, actually within half a percentage point of our pre-COVID um, ridership numbers. So that's really exciting news for us. And as Tim mentioned, we're seeing similar upticks in our specialized ridership, um, as you can see here. Um, for our total specialized and fixed route ridership, um, we're within 10% of our pre-COVID um, levels. And that's all I have for you. Thank you, that's very interesting. And exciting. Good. Thanks, Emily. Um, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
brief safety performance report for the month of July, uh, starting with results for this month, <clears throat> external events. We did have 27 in the month of June. In July, we had 28. Non-preventable incidents, in June, we had 13. And in July, we had 18. Preventable, we did see a decrease. In June, we had 14. And in July, we had 10. Um, some of the main takeaways, as I stated, we did see an increase in accidents from June to July by one. Um, decrease in passenger incidents and an overall decrease in preventable incidents um, from the month of June to July. Specialized care, passenger events were zero, traffic events were five, and five of those were preventable. Majority of those were just uh, fixed object type things. Um, tree limbs, uh, mirrors, hidden poles, things of that nature. We'll continue to do with the safety blitz to make sure everybody is remaining as safe as possible, getting good results from that with Tim's team supporting that as well as our training and safety staff, making sure that they're, they're doing um, everything they possibly can to keep everyone as safe as possible. And if there are no questions, that concludes the safety performance report for the month of July. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Good morning. For the month of July, there were 4,651 miles between uh, road calls in comparison with June, which was 4,288. Our PMs for the month of July was at 63%, which is slow, whereas our goal is 80%. This percentage is continuing to drop, but we're using overtime to manage it. We're looking into, uh, we've looked into all outside vendors to support our repairs but they're having the same issues with hiring mechanics as we are. We've reached out to other transit authorities also and found it this to be an industry-wide issue. Although manpower is low, this has not impacted our service to date, but we are in line where we may see a backlog of repairs causing a shortage of buses available. Uh, we uh, continue to clean our buses daily and we disinfect them also. We will be shortly starting our bus stop power washing in-house, which preserves about five positions, so we won't be letting anyone go in our department. That concludes the maintenance department report. Um, any questions of, of uh, these folks? Excellent and brief reports. Thank you. I add, Mr. Chairman? Yep. I think that uh, I'm, I'm, I am particularly excited with uh, Tony Bird's report about mm -hmm. using in-house staff for the shelter cleaning. In the past, we have cleaned uh, predominantly focused on uh, using our staff predominantly focused on the shelter cleaning. Uh, since the start of COVID, we've been expanding that to, to look at shelters. And as we expand our shelter program, even though we do have this partnership with RVA Rapid Transit to help maintain our stops, um, putting this extra emphasis on the cleanliness and um, of all of our shelters and benches, I think is an important role to expanding our our, our visibility, uh, our good visibility in the community. And so I really applaud Tony for working with the facility staff to make this happen for us. So we're expanding some of our shelter cleaning work beyond the BRT um, places, which we had been cleaning to some of the, our other shelters as well, right? During Thank COVID, you. We, during COVID, we started with some of our major transfer centers and the, the highest and some of our highest use, and now we're expanding to all shelters. Excellent. Thank you. And I'd also like to commend Mr. Bird really quickly, just because it appears that we've gotten additional maintenance calls this past month, but has not impacted our service at all. So keep up the good work. Uh, Mr. Right. Chairman, yes. Uh, unfortunately, like I said earlier, I have a 10 o'clock hard stop um, and I'm going to have to chime off. But if I can foreshadow just a bit, I did re um, review the presentation on uh, DBE and I am uh, heartened by uh, what GRTC is doing to actually be very intentional in their efforts to um, make um, better use of um, small and minority owned uh, businesses. But I'm sorry that I can't be here for the official presentation, but I had a bounce. Well, thanks for monitoring that, George, and for, and for staying after it uh, the way you have and uh, just paying Thank out. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, John Cenzarella, I think you're up next, right? Good morning. I'm going to share my screen. Good morning. Okay. There we go. 
All right. So starting the financial uh, documents are starting on page 57 of your handout. Um, going. We're having a little technical issue going on. I'm frozen. Okay, there we go. All right, here we go. So visible, you, you should be able to see here now. John, you're frozen. Discussions again. from the prior. John, no. your, your screen unshared. All right, I'll try this again. And you all see the source of funds, uh, which is slide 58 in the deck. Uh, this is, uh, as we've been talking about for the prior month's briefings, um, revenues. Uh, this is for the 12 months ended June 30th, 2021. I also want to comment that these uh, financial statements are draft unaudited, and, um, but they do provide an accurate representation of the GRTC's financial operating performance for the 12 month periods. Uh, we're currently in the financial audit uh, process with Brown Edwards, so there may be some, you know, adjusting entries for, um, you know, certain, you know, pension and OPEB entries and so forth that are not reflected herein. Um, so the takeaway here is, uh, for the 12 months end of June 30th, revenues are unfavorable to budget around two two million dollars on a budget of 60.3 million, or about 3.35 percent um, uh, unfavorable. Very similar as, as in prior months, you see the directly generated uh, funds are $300,000 favorable to budget based upon the advertising revenue, primarily in the university pass program. Um, the local government funds are, as, as reported in the prior months, uh, unfavorable $156,000, but this is basically a result of uh, Chesterfield revenues being lower than budget, driven by the favorable operating expenses, as well as the COVID relief funding. Uh, the state, Government funds are 2.47 million favorable on a budget of 9.63 million. That's a result of favorable operating contributions from the state. And kind of a, a change this month here for the federal funds, uh, it's still unfavorable at 4.69 million on a budget of 35 million. Um, that's basically driven by favorable to budget operating expenses, which is uh, 2.59 uh, million for favorable operating expenses, which we'll detail later. Um, but you'll notice that the the uh, Deficit and CARES Act has reduced, and that's by a function of um, the Essential Employees Performance Bonus, which was recorded during the month of June. So um, basically pretty much similar as we briefed in the prior months. Um, the slide uh, 59 is the narrative uh, or the detailed charts of this. Um, going to the I chart, we'll skip over that, but going to slide uh, 61 and 62. This is the operating expenses where you can see, as you will see here, the largest changes that from the prior month. So you'll note now that the total labor is unfavorable by $807,000 uh, versus budget. And this is, as I mentioned just briefly, briefly this is driven by the uh, essential employees uh, performance bonus, which was in in the dollar amount of $1,991,000. So as you can see that um, the previous month, yeah, May year to date, labor was favorable about a million and a half. So um, we, we still have some favorable uh, uh, vacancies that are contributing to a offsetting the unfavorableness for the month of June. But primarily the, the big event in the month of June was uh, the payout of the essential uh, uh, employees performance bonus. And you'll see that um, throughout the various pieces of the schedule. Vehicle operations is... Uh, is $1 million on favorable labor variance of which 898,000 is reflected on the operator salary. And this once again is the biggest component um, due to the essential uh, workers bonus. In addition, uh, facility maintenance and vehicle maintenance are kind of a flop of each other, which they net to about zero, but that was, there was also impacts there uh, on the vehicle maintenance as a result of the essential uh, in, uh, employee bonus program. And general administration uh, is still favorable in labor um, you'll notice throughout the document, there is some fringe benefit favorability, but this is more or less driven by a reduced headcount uh, where medical is favorable offset by unfavorable uh, pension expenses. In addition, 
um, the line items for services, as you'll see here, uh, still $1.95 million uh, favorable versus budget. Um, that's, you know, you, due to the lack of BRT fair collections, uh, favorable uh, and, and the, and, uh, and the uh, security services associated with that, uh, favorable consulting services and the timing, some other uh, expenses. Um, contract maintenance services is favorable as well as, as we reported the prior months. Um, materials and services consumed is unfavorable at a rate of 1.3 million. And this is, um, I'm sorry, this uh, materials and services uh, supply is consumed is unfair one, but due to the higher cleaning and sanitizing expenses uh, with COVID. Uh, moving over to slide, uh, the next slides here where you show the detailed tables. Uh, looking at the revenue miles uh, and the revenue hours, uh, the operating expense per mile, uh, still favorable to budget. Um, Also noting when we look at the categories, the operating expense and uh, per the per mile and also the the operating hours per mile, you'll see that um, all the categories are primarily favorable to budget, with the exception of general administration. That is more or less due to the COVID expenses; they're being categorized into the general administration. So that's what's driving the unfavorable performance there, offset by the favorable headcount, favorable expenses in the GNA. Um, as discussed, you know, you know, we still have the favorable headcount looking at the the budget, uh, actual headcount versus budget, which is offsetting some of the impact of the of the essential employee bonus that was paid during the or it's paid in July, but reported in the month of June. Moving over to slide 74, we have the income statement, and you know, consistent with the prior months, we were having favorable operating revenue to the tune of about 456,000 versus the budget, un offset by unfavorable other income, which is primarily the interest income, uh, the expectations that the, when the budget was set that there was gonna be a greater amount of funds available to invest at a higher rate. Um, and as you can see that the operating contributions are unfavorable 2.375 million, and that's kind of the, the, the same explanations that we followed in the source of funds. You also see that here, the operating expenses of 2.586 million uh, favorable versus budget, resulting in a net, net change in position of approximately about $500,000 favorable uh, for the 12 month period. John, what was that? Um, I, I, I didn't understand why that um, operating contribution from the feds has such a high. Um, well, there, there's two components of this. Number one is that the, uh, the operating contribution from the Fed uh, is based upon reimbursement. So therefore, we're about $2.58 million in expenses favorable to the budget. So that's one component of it. And the second component of it is um, the uh, 5307, uh, we had utilized the fiscal year 2020 grant uh, to flex over for PM, uh, 5307 uh, reimbursed 80% of the PM. That that uh, fiscal year 2020 grant exhausted in the month of February, I believe, and we have opted not to. Uh, we're, we're using utilizing the CARES Act to, to cover it. So um, it's okay. primarily it's lack of spending, uh, or, you know, favorable spending on the operating expense, and then it's also a little bit in peace uh, due to the uh, exhaustion of the fiscal year 2020 uh, uh, 5307 flexed uh, money for uh, preventative maintenance. Thank you. As you can see in the operating expense, the red areas, you know, the equipment facility maintenance, transportation, and the operating taxes and licenses, those are all um, due to the, the recording of the 1,991,000 essential operating bonus in the month of June. Uh, the operating taxes is FICA, which just put it uh, unfavorable. Looking at the balance sheet on, um, on slide uh, 75. Um, this is once again, this is an audit draft. There's a couple of adjusting entries that will probably need to make for uh, like the, the pension plan and OPEP. But as you can see, uh, cash position uh, stronger than the prior year's balance also 
Uh, you'll see a little it, for the month of June an increase in the accounts receivable balance over the prior months. That's basically driven by the CARES Act uh, reimbursement, uh, which is around a little over $4 million. That's uh, for the CARES Act money. So that's kind of just timing the way our operating cycle. And, and you know, obviously, $2 million of this roughly is the bonus of speaking reimbursement. Um, you can see down here in the other assets, the restricted funds for the CBTA money. Um, and then, as you know, these the deferred outflows, the GASB 6875 adjustments are coming forth. They're not reflected in here. Um, uh, moving over to slide 77, uh, the CBTA. I, I showed you a little more in depth of this uh, report uh, at the July meeting, but this is the actual version of the report that uh, was filed with CBTA. Um, this uh, at the end of last week uh, uh, in, in, uh, in to comply with our August 15th filing deadline. As you can see, uh, there's a balance in the CBTA funds as of the end of June of 16.3 million, and that's split around $3.3 million was in the Wells Fargo Bank at the end of June, and uh, $13 million was invested in the L LGIP extended maturity. And uh, as you can see, uh, Sorry, I hopped over a slide. I, I skipped over the cash flow slide on 76. But as I was, my comment was, as you can see here on slide 76 in the cash flow during the preliminary July, we moved $4.74 million over from um, our CBTA funds into our GRTC operating accounts in early July, which is basically the first quarter funding. Um, and as you can see, uh, we're going to follow the, you know, at quarter end, the, the, the cash balance is low. Then it gets funded up as we take the draw for CBTA, and then it works its way down uh, to the low point in the quarter, and then we replenish. Um, discussions, uh, you know, points to note here, as you historically recall, that the first quarter of the fiscal year is usually a very cash-intensive outflow when we have a lot of renewals for uh, insurances that go out. So um, we are not we are not um, necessitating the need to draw on any reserves uh, as. We have planned accordingly with our cash flow. And at, with that, I, I will conclude my comments on the financial updates and leave the floor open for any questions. Thank you. Questions? Comments? All right, sir. Thank you. Um, next item is um, Ms. Thompson, recent and upcoming procurements, right? I will continue in the spirit of briefness <laughs> so that we can get to the nitty gritty, which is Antoinette with her um, report on supplier diversity. Um, you can find information, um, procurements documents on pages 78 and 79 of your packet. We did have one procurement. It was a change order for portable um, restroom services that required the board chair's approval between board meetings. We're still having a hard time locating the restroom facilities for our operators, and we've identified the need for facilities in Richmond's north side. Staff is adding a restroom at the lot located at Moss Side Avenue in Akron Street near Mary Scott Elementary. These services will be provided through December 2021 for an additional cost of $4,950. Services include cleaning of the faci facilities daily, Monday through Friday, and this change order will bring the total contract value to $105,090. We have tweaked the upcoming procurements report a bit. As you can see, we included a key this time to provide you with additional information on the funding status for each project. Funding status is now described as ready meaning the project has been approved and funds are available. Existing, meaning the project has been approved and funds will be applied to a grant. Pending, meaning we have applied for funds and are awaiting approval. And then planned, which means staff has identified a need and funds will be applied for in the future. Are there any questions about the key? Thank you. Uh, moving right along, I just have a little bit more. <laughs> I'd like to update you on the enterprise resource planning procurement. We've received seven proposals and 
are in the process of going through several rounds of evaluations and that will also include demonstrations. Our goal is to bring the board a recommendation in the fall to winter of this year. And lastly, we have added one new pro project to the list. Our floors in the maintenance department tend to accumulate a lot of water due to condensation when it gets very humid. This creates unsafe conditions and we have been considering approaches to resolve the issue. We are currently in the planning stage of this procurement and have earmarked $100,000 for this project, which you guys have approved in our FY22 board approved budget. And funding for this is existing and we look forward to bringing a recommendation to you sometime this winter. That is all I have for you unless you have any questions for me. Thank you very Thank you much. Time. Thanks. All right. So, uh, Antoinette, I think, yes. Ms. yes good morning. Good morning. I'm going to share my screen, uh, hopefully quite quickly. You can let me know if you see the screen or not. Okay. Outstanding. So um, this is a brief overview of GRTC Supply Diversity Program. Uh, we wanted to ensure the board of directors and our local uh, business community that GRTC is making every effort uh, to ensure that we um, include small and diverse businesses in our procurement process. Um, I do wanna thank uh, board member Braxton for his uh, commitment to keeping attention on the program, very important program for us and our business community. So I'll just share all about the program and some of the things that we do to ensure that we have participation. GRTC Supply Diversity Program includes two small business initiatives. Our state program of the Commonwealth of Virginia, which is our small uh, women and minority business program, better known as SWAM to most, and our US Department of Transportation Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program, which is known as the DBE program. Uh oh, slides not moving. Oh, there we go. So I just want to highlight GRTC SWAM program in this slide. Uh, our SWAM program supports certified small women and minority businesses with an emphasis, which is very important here. It's an emphasis on the local business community. The focus is to promote procurement opportunities that are funded with state dollars. This program is an internal program that GRTC adopted. Uh, not in response to regulatory or mandatory requirements, but as an effort to support programs that enhance economic development within our community. Our program goals are established annually based on our previous year's spend, and our current goal for FY22 is 9%. The performance is tracked and reported on a monthly basis. Now, to highlight our DBE program, uh, this program supports certified disadvantaged business enterprises with an emphasis on state and local transportation projects funded with federal dollars. It is a mandated uh, program. It is required by the Federal Transit Administration that GRTC establish overall DBE goal every three years. Uh, current goal is 8%. And this would cover federal fiscal year 2020 through federal fiscal year 2022. Um, I will tell you that uh, we have struggled with this particular part of our program simply because we identify capital projects that sometimes we have the capital funds for, I mean, the federal funds for, but we may not have the state match for. So we've had quite a few programs over the last three years federal fiscal year 2020 through 2022 that we've had to put on hold based on match funds. So while our goal is 8% for DBE, um, our report uh, as of June 1, which was our first half of our federal fiscal year uh, 2022, we were at 1.5%. So we've got a ways to go. Um, Tanya just mentioned our enterprise resource program project uh, enterprise resource planning project. And that particular project is gonna be important for us because we do have a DBE goal on that particular contract. It is 12%. Um, it's a, it's gonna be a significant amount. We're not sure of the actual dollar amount, but it might be somewhere in the millions. So it's a good opportunity 
uh, for DBE participation, and we're looking forward to closing the gap on that. Uh, federal regulations ex uh, expect recipients to meet the maximum portion of our DBE goal through what they consider is race neutral means, uh, which means that uh, no goals are applied to the project, that basically you're going to do outreach to reach those DBEs who are interested in uh, participating in your procurements uh, that are federally funded. Uh, GRTC is required to report DBE participation on a semi-annual basis to the Federal Transit Administration, as I mentioned on June 1 and on December 1 of each federal fiscal year. Uh, our internal process to ensure SWAM and DBE participation, these are just a few of the things that we do that we think are, and, and it's internal, so this is not the external that we do, but this is the internal. Uh, online vendor registration form. This form can be found on our website on the procurement page. Uh, this gives businesses an opportunity to let us know that they're interested in doing business with us. And we use this registration to create what we call our internal vendors list. It's our source list that we use to source for businesses when we're looking to procure specific projects or uh, commodities. We also post upcoming projects uh, on the website. Tanya just went through uh, quite a few of the upcoming projects. All of those are pretty much posted already on the website. We do this so that these businesses have an opportunity to go out to our website and see what's coming up and they can plan to participate. Uh, also, one of the big things that I, I definitely think is important is that we use the requisition process um, to uh, request all goods and services um, to allow us time to review each requisition for small business uh, opportunities. Uh, this is uh, each department who is requesting any sort of purchase or a commodity or a service, they have to fill this requisition out. The great thing about it is it gives us a wealth of information about the project, how it's funded, the specifications, et cetera, which allows us an opportunity to look for uh, opportunities for small businesses. So that's a big part of our internal process. Also, we work with our end users during the planning phase of their projects to try to identify diverse suppliers up front. Next, this is our, a snapshot of our diverse spend uh, for year end 21 versus our goal. Uh, so this would be uh, through June 30th of 2021. GRTC has a supply diversity goal of 17%. We've had that 17% goal over the last three years. We have not met the goal yet. We are making progress. Uh, as you all know, COVID year was just very difficult for, for us all, but we've made progress non the least. Uh, this particular slide shows you our spend by business category. So uh, it shows you your, the women business or WBE enterprise. It shows you your minority business enterprise where we are. It shows you the DBE spend. And it also has a category, which is a SBE, which is our small business spend, which is inclusive of all categories. So that small business spend of 9.4% for fiscal year 21 includes our spend with women, minorities, and DBEs. It is an inclusive spend. As you will also notice on this particular slide that's important is that we definitely exceeded our goal in women business enterprises and minority business enterprises. And that is due to basically for the women business enterprises, we had a petroleum vendor that was a DBE, a woman DBE. And those are expenses that were pretty significant that we spent on a monthly basis. Um, we are not changing our spend goal because we have lost that particular vendor. And that uh, source has now gone to someone that is not a woman business and is not a small business. So, uh, you know, we are still working to increase women business participation, minority, and of course, DBEs. These are all small businesses. I think GRTC does a great job of making sure that we are inclusive of these folks in our uh, procurement processes. This last slide is a snapshot of how, what we spent with diverse suppliers by department. Um, this is just a, a good way for us to look at how we're doing within the departments and identify uh, any potential opportunities for the future. 
That concludes my brief summary of our supply diversity program. Are there any questions? Are there questions or comments? Thank you for um, that excellent report. You. Well, it's it's exciting um, to, to see that level of intentionality. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, it looks like we have one more thing here, which is uh, 401A 457 plan policy changes updates from John Zanzarella. John, you're with us? Yes. All right. All right, uh, I'm gonna need to share my screen, but uh... all right, well. Um, can, Rob, can you help out? I think Antoinette's still sharing, there we go. Thank you. So. Okay, so on my screen, you should be able to see the uh, the board action item for the 401A457 plan change policy, which is on pages 91 and 92 of the handout. Um, back at the April uh, 2021 uh, board of directors meeting, uh, the board of directors authorized the, the GRTC chief executive officer and financial officer uh, to make amendments and take appropriate actions necessary to maintain the qualification of the plans and the exemption of the applicable trusts under the sections 401A and 501A of the Internal Revenue Code of 1986. Um, and also at that point, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, any items that would constitute a substantive or material change in the provisions of the plan would need to come back for uh, authorization and approval by the board. So today's uh, meeting, I want to first uh, report that at this time, the fact that both 401A and 47B plans have been updated, executed, and all required regulatory filings have been submitted to maintain the qualifications of the plans. During this review, um, there were uh, looking at detailed uh, reviews of the plan and the plan conditions. Uh, there are a couple items that uh, GRTC management like to propose uh, as changes to the provisions within the 401A and 457 plan. Uh, item number one, um, both the 401A and 457B plans, these are the plans specifically for uh, the exempt and excluded uh, population. This is not the 457 for the collective bargaining folks. But uh, want to revise the vesting periods for both the 401A and the 457B plans from the current three-year period to a period of one year. Uh, it is our belief that the GRTC's contributions, especially uh, for the 401A, which the GRTC makes a 3% contribution to all exempt uh, enrolled and exempt employees, and as well as a up to 6% matching contribution to 457B. Uh, for all enrolled uh, participants uh, are key components of an employee GRTC employee's compensation. And it is our position that deferring this component of the employee's compensation, you know, for multiple years is not equitable um, as GRTC has already received the benefit of the employee's labor during the current fiscal year to which the award is made. So we're recommending um, the modification of the vesting schedule from three years for both the 401A and 457B to a one year period. Uh, item number two, in addition, the uh, 457B plan was implemented uh, during the middle of 2002 and what, what had at that point in time, all employees of GRTC were members of the Old Dominion Transit Employee and Retirement Allowance Plan, which is known as the Defined Benefit Pension Plan. So um, going forward, uh, the new exempt excluded population, we're going to participate in the 457B where they would contribute up to 6% pre-tax and GRTC would match up to 6% matching their contributions. Um, at that time, uh, individuals that were in the DB plan were given the option. They did not have to, they had to either choose to enter into the defined contribution 457B plan or remain in the defined benefit plan. Um, Currently, there are 16 non-bargaining unit employees who are active participants in the defined benefit plan. Um, and one of the things that, you know, as you're, as you're aware of through the new collective bargaining unit agreements, the 
current contribution level into the defined benefit plan for collective bargaining unit employees is 9% and GRTC provides 13% of the covered wages. The 16 employees, as they're not covered by the bargaining unit, their contributions have remained at what they were as of 2002, which is 4% for the employee and GRTC is making up the difference of 18%. Um, what we're asking for in this resolution is for the, the individuals that opted to remain in the uh, Old Dominion Transit Employees Retirement Allowance or the Defined Benefit Plan, that their contribution levels uh, are updated to be concurrent with those as prescribed in the, in the Collective Bargaining Unit Agreement. Um, the Collective Bargaining Unit Agreement, as of October 1st of 2021, has the employees contributing 10.5% and GRTC increasing its contribution to 14%. Um, this is you know, a, a part and course because the funded status of the Old Dominion Transit Employees and Retirement Allowance Plan as of December 31st, 2020 is funded around 37%. So it, you know, there's an orchestrated step up of funding by both uh, the collective bargaining unit employees as well as GRTC over the next several years that are covered by the collective bargaining unit contract. As this is a, uh, a change, um, at the same time, any individual, uh, for the 16 individuals, we're going to basically offer the same option that they had in 2002, where they can elect to either opt out of the defined benefit plan, where their benefit would be frozen, and then they can come into the 457B plan. Or if they opt to stay in the defined benefit plan, their contribution um, rate will increase to that of what is identified in the collective bargaining unit agreement. And in addition, um, their GRTC will no longer make the 3% employer contribution in the 401A for any employee that decides to remain in the defined benefit plan. Um, so the recommendation here uh, following discussion is to allow uh, the GRTC chief executive officer to amend the, uh, the plan uh, the definition of, of, you know, of the 401A plan to exclude active participants in the old Dominion Transit Employee and Retirement Allowance Plan, as well as to adjust the contribution amounts of any non-bargaining unit employees who are actively participating in the old Dominion Transit Employee and Retirement Allowance Plan to match the contribution amounts outlined in the current collective bargaining unit contract following a 30-day period to opt out of the plan and become a member of the 457B plan. So. Technically, on our timeline, we're here in the middle of August. So, theoretically, if we, uh, if if this uh, resolution is passed, our timeline would be to circulate a letter to the affected employees by September 1st, so that um, you know October 1st they would be uh, at the new uh, contribution rates as prescribed in the collective bargaining unit contract. Um, if there are any questions? I'll take them at this time. So you've got uh, <clears throat> a resolution here um, with uh, with two parts to it. One deals with the um, vesting um, of the retirement uh, at a one year rather than three years, um, which doesn't have any financial implications except uh, to the person who has already had a contribution made on their behalf um, being vested sooner. Um, but it doesn't cost the company anymore, correct? The, uh, in the event, if an employee left uh, at, at, with a three-year vesting period in the 401 and 457, if an employee left after, let's say, two years, the company match would be forfeited. It would go to a forfeiture account. Um, the forfeiture's account can be utilized by GRTC to fund plan expenses uh, in those plans, as well as offset uh, contribution needs to... GRTC currently has a forfeiture balance, which we're utilizing, um, but there will be no incremental expense other than, you know, if, if the forfeiture would not come back to offset con uh, contributions, that's the only impact. All right. And that is something that, um, that I think we actually asked you all to do a while back. And so the, um, and the other one deals with uh, some kind of harmonizing of these uh, retirement plans and the uh, removal of, of dual coverage in certain circumstances. That's correct. Right. Uh, any questions on this? Could I have a motion to approve this? So moved. 
Second. Hello. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded that we approve this report and these recommendations um, dealing with vet, with retirement um, from John Zanzarella. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Um, no, the motion is passed. There are none opposed. And I think that completes it. Thank you, Mr. Zanzarella. Um, now we have the CEO's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, two specific items I would like to address today. One is we did not have much time to talk about the COVID activities and where we are with uh, responding to COVID in detail. Last month, I reported on the DOLE uh, advancement of their permanent, final permanent standard for COVID work-related rules. That was under public comment until July 31st. Uh, we've been monitoring that. They did have a public hearing on August 5th. However, the final decision regarding that document has not been posted on their website. So we continue to monitor that uh, to see where the, the final standard falls. In contrast with what was reported last month, however, we are delaying many of the components of our new normal uh, for the next several months. I hope to call it something else in the future besides new normal. But for riders, we will maintain rear door boarding. We had reported last month that we were gonna to move towards dual door boarding. We will maintain rear door boarding for all passengers except for those needing operator assistance. We will also return to asking public to minimize or eliminate non-essential trips as we are reaching capacity on some of our buses and we certainly return to uh, pre-COVID levels and yet COVID has not lessened it actually yet once again increasing in the states. We will continue to maintain our policy against joyriding, that trips should not extend beyond the uh, initial origin of the, the trip, that masks will likely be required ongoing past the current set date of September 13th. If you recall, uh, the federal rules are suggesting that transit and transportation related requirements for mask wearing is set to expire on September 13th with the um, the increase of the Delta variant and with COVID in our communities across the country and in the state, I believe it is very likely we will continue to require masks well into the fall, possibly into the winter. We will monitor the situation and update the community and our riders accordingly. For employees, uh, the change will be that we will continue to offer that one day vaccination pay to encourage, continue to encourage employees to receive the vaccination. Uh, we, have, we are probably around, I think last estimate was somewhere between 63 to 65% vaccinated, which I think is way too low. We are watching the vaccine mandates across the country, in the state, in our region, with other transit agencies, and we are very seriously considering a possible vaccine mandate for our employees. Uh, regarding the board and specific to the board is that as the, we're under the city state of emergency, we're allowed to have virtual board meetings until that state of emergency lapses in December. Uh, Plan RVA has generously agreed to allow us to use our boardroom to host our virtual in-person hybrid board meetings starting as early as January. The space is much larger than our boardroom and they have the technical capacity and the physical space for a safe hybrid board meeting that allows public access. Um, while it is likely that the General Assembly will consider a modification to public meeting laws this session and to allow for more flexible use of virtual hybrid meetings, um, we don't know where that stands. So uh, until that is resolved, we do know that we have a location and a good location to hold board meetings when the board decides it is ready to do so. Um, this one I'm, is a little bit more complex. My last item, it has to do with our annual financial audit audits. You may be aware that, um, as John said, the information, the financial information you received this month was the unaudited financial returns. We are in the midst of our audit procedures for our FY21. Uh, generally accepted auditing standards require that an entity's external auditors, in this case ours is Brown Edwards, to communicate and share information with our board of directors. 
Now, in prior years, Brown Edwards has done this by emailing the correspondence letters to the treasurer of GRTC and Ride Finders Board. Um, best practice would be for these letters, uh, one for the GRTC financial audit and one for Ride Finders audit to be emailed to all members of the board. So these letters are addressed to the board of directors of GRTC and Ride Finders. And in the letters, Brown Edwards outlines three things. Your responsibility under the U.S. generally accepted auditing standards and government auditing standards. It identifies the planned scope and timing of the audit and notes of the engagement partner, um, and which is Leslie Roberts. And it also uh, includes uh, an item about inquiries concerning possible fraud. And this is a standard. It's a standard questionnaire, which is asked of board members as well as members of executive management and key financial personnel to help Brown Edwards assess risk of misstatements in the financial audit statements due to fraud or error. Uh, the letter provides contact information for members of the audit team if any member of the board of directors wishes to share any information or concerns directly with the auditors. Again, this is a standard questionnaire that's part of the audit process. Um, it's a standard communication overall. While no response is required to the auditors, uh, this is your opportunity to do so if there is something that warrants your direct interaction. Um, if there aren't any concerns by more uh, members of the board, you do not have to respond. So these letters will be emailed to each of you following today's meeting so that we can follow current best practices for our auditing process. Um, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, if there are no questions, that does conclude, finally, the CEO's report for August. Any questions or comments for the CEO? Thank you so much, and thank you for uh, just your consistent um, attention and, and work, um, Ms. Tim. The um, I think the ability of this group of people to discuss, in particular, these difficult issues and the and the and the no fair uh, issue is due to the attention and information that you have have, uh, have done with the board and. Um, I'm really grateful for that as, as well as for your research. I, my one um, statement is to make an appeal to the employees of GRTC to get vaccinated. Uh, we have spent thousands and thousands of dollars and made enormous efforts to make sure that our employees were safe, cared for, and had proper medical care during COVID. Um, and it seems to me that um, that personal responsibility for vaccination uh, is really important, and uh, and I would deeply appreciate it um, if you would uh, consider or reconsider this action. My my wife and I got vaccinated months ago. It's changed our life and made a lot of things possible. Uh, it's also made things easier for everybody who has to deal with us and whom we help. So uh, please help us there. Um, you know, there are vaccine mandates going in all over the country. That's not something that, uh, that we're anxious to do, but uh, this is a very, very serious problem. And, uh, and we need you to take the steps to protect yourselves that we have taken to try to protect you. Uh, that's all I have to say. Is there any other business?